Good evening, everyone. We'd like to call to order the regular regular meeting of the City Commission for Tuesday, October 3rd, 2017. We'll please have a roll call. Commissioner Battle. Here. Commissioner Droski. Here. Commissioner Parnas. Here. Vice Mayor Miller. Here. Mayor Gantz. Here. I'd like everyone to please rise for a moment of silence. And I ask all of us to remember the victims of the Las Vegas shooting and all of those in Puerto Rico here. I can just remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones before we get started with the agenda. 
First time in the agenda, of the, in the agenda is the approval of the City Commission minutes. Motion to approve the City Agenda minutes of September 5 and September 13, I think. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Moving on to the acknowledgement of the City Board minutes. Uh, for the Cultural Committee Board Meeting Minutes for July 17, 2017 and the Code Compliance Minutes for July 26, 2017. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Um, next we'd like to move on to our presentations. And uh, this is a little bit of uh, public embarrassment, but uh, hopefully it's a good public embarrassment. Yes, yes, ma'am. Motion to approve the agenda. Oh, I'm so sorry. We do have motion. Uh, motion. I apologize. I have a motion to approve the agenda. We have a motion to approve the City Commission agenda for October 3rd, 2017, and a second. Second. We already have a second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Okay. So now for our first presentation, uh, I'm going to ask Ms. Kathleen Williams to please come up to the podium. <laughs> The City Commission has decided to come up with what will be an annual award to the Volunteer of the Year for the Deerfield Beach Little League. Um, the one thing that the City staff would like to work out with Deerfield Beach Little League is they will be, pre they will be picking who their volunteer, year, uh, volunteer of the Year uh, is each year from here on, hopefully till the end of time. And with that, we felt this year that it was very easy to pick the one volunteer that I think would be a unanimous decision by your board before we turned it over to the Little League uh, to turn it over uh, for them to make that decision. But for those of you who don't know, Kathleen Williams has been a resident of Deerfield Beach since 1995 when she moved from Philadelphia with her two daughters. Within the year, Kathleen met her husband Christopher for whom this award will be named after. Hi. This will be the Christopher Williams uh, Little League Volunteer of the Year Award. In 2004, Ms. Williams joined the board for the Deerfield Beach Little League while her husband was a coach within the league. Following Brian Johnson's retirement, Ms. Williams became president of the league, overseeing 13 seasons of Little League baseball. Ms. Williams and her family have been a large part of the success of the Deerfield Beach Little League program. Ms. Williams lives by the motto that if your children are participating, then you must participate too. Following this lifestyle, her and her family have influenced multiple lives, creating friendships that go deeper than meeting on the baseball field. At this time, Ms. Williams decided to take a step back from the league and let the next person take over. The city of Deerfield Beach is grateful for your dedication and contribution to not only the Deerfield Beach Little League, but to the community. We're proud to present you with the Christopher Williams Little League Volunteer of the Year Award, and please join us in honoring Kathleen Williams. Thank you, Mayor Ganson, the Commission, um, the relationship with Deerfield, the City Commission, and the Mayors over the past 13 seasons has always been, we make a great team. Um, the 60 years of Little League running in the city, and I think we're going to at least have 60 more. I uh, thank you. Name me after my husband, you killed me. <laughs> I appreciate everything. And I'm not leaving. I'm still going to be on the board. I'm just not going to be president anymore. I'm still at the high school. We still have kids here. In 2020, I think I'll officially be done with it. But thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kathleen, if you don't mind staying around, we're going to do photographs at the end if that's all right. Our next item is for students who received a perfect score on the Florida Standards Assessment at the end of course uh, assessment. The City of Deerfield Beach applauds you, applauds you for working so hard to become a top scholar. These students have received perfect scores on Florida Standards Assessment and end of course assessment. The assessment system measures students' achievement of Florida's education standards which were developed and implemented to ensure that all students graduate from high school ready for success in college, their career, and in life. Please join us in recognizing these students who accomplished something pretty extraordinary and made their city very, very proud. So if the following students could please come forward. Ajay Sigalam, eighth grade. Tariq <laughs> Baker, eighth grade.
Madison Peterkin, sixth grade. <laughs> Catherine Humes, eighth grade. <laughs> Michaela Kennedy, eighth grade. <laughs> Jaida Golem, seventh grade. <laughs> Mariana Gumeris, eighth grade. And Maya Gagovsky, sixth grade. <laughs> if I butchered any of your names, uh, my sincere apologies. Let's squeeze in a little bit tighter, guys. A little bit more, a little bit more. Commissioner Drosky, could we get you on the side? <laughs> Our next is a proclamation. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, there have been 446 gun-related domestic violence fatalities this year. 10 million people a year are physically abused by an intimate partner, and 20,000 calls are placed a day. Women in Distress of Broward County Incorporated is the only nationally accredited, state-certified, full-service domestic violence center serving Broward County through a 24-hour crisis intervention hotline and emergency shelter, as well as offering counseling and support for victims and children. And we call on the residents of the city of Deerfield Beach to speak out against domestic violence and support local efforts to assist victims of those crimes and finding the way to find healing and help for those in need. Now, therefore, I, Bill Gans, the mayor of the city of Deerfield Beach, Florida, in recognition thereof, do hereby proclaim October 2017 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And in the city of Deerfield Beach, we encourage the victims, their loved ones, and concerned citizens to help raise awareness of this serious issue. Do we have anyone from the women in distress here tonight? Yes, ma'am. Please come up. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Jean Giovanelli. I'm the uh, Associate Director of Advancement at Women in Distress of Broward County. On behalf of Women in Distress and the domestic victims uh, we serve, we'd like to thank you and the City of Deerfield Beach for your ongoing support of our programs and the commitment that you bring awareness to this issue. A few more statistics um, from what you already elaborated on, but according to National Statistics 1 in 3, um, 
women and one in four women and 25 to 33 percent of the LGBTQ community have been victims of some form of violence by an intimate partner within their lifetime. So that's why we, the mission at Women in Distress is to stop domestic violence abuse for everyone throughout, uh, through intervention, education, and advocacy. By providing these free services to all victims of abuse and their children and through the support of the communities like the city of Deerfield Beach, we work every day to strive towards accomplishing that mission. Last fiscal year, we provided approximately 2,800 survivors of domestic violence with critical services. We would like to take this opportunity to invite the community to the annual Silent Witness Memorial this year held by the Broward Victims Rights Coalition on October 10th at 6 p.m. at Long Key Nature Center, as well as to other Domestic Violence Awareness Month events, which you can find on our website at womenindistress.org. So thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. We appreciate it, and thank you for your support to help our mission to end domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you. Our next proclamation has been sponsored by Commissioner Drosky. Uh, this is in recognition for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society campaign. And we have Lydia Rodriguez, their campaign manager. Is she here tonight? Ms. Rodriguez, you mind coming up? Blood cancers are cancers of the blood, bone marrow, or lymph nodes that, are, that affect normal blood cell production or function. Today, nearly 1.3 million people in the United States are living with or are in remission from leukemia, lymphoma, or my, uh, uh, myeloma. Blood cancer can affect anyone at any time. There is no way to prevent or screen for most blood cancers, so the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is focusing on finding cures. Now, therefore, I, Bill Gans, the mayor of the city of Deerfield Beach, Florida, in recognition thereof, do hereby proclaim September 2017 as Blood Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you. So I just want to say one little thing. Um, due to the hurricanes, um, we have a lot of our patients um, all over the U.S. and especially in Puerto Rico right now that because they do not have electricity or the hospitals are in dire need, uh, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society invested $1 million towards our patients for travel assistance to get into the U.S. or to help pay for any of the medical needs. So thank you to everyone to support our organization. Thank you. <laughs> the next certificate we have is for one of our own. One of our own, Landon Kennedy. Come on up, Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy started his career within the city of Deerfield Beach on August 16, 1990 as Utilities Maintenance Worker 1. In December of 1992, he was promoted to Utility Service Worker and again in 2006 to the Cross Connection Control Specialist. Mr. Kennedy holds the highest level certif certification to protect the city's drinking water. He consistently ensured that all service connections have certified backflow devices to prevent contamination to the city's water distribution center. Not only has Mr. Kennedy served the city of Deerfield Beach, but he also has served his country for six years in the United States Navy. Please join me in recognizing Mr. Kennedy for his 27 years of service 
and may you enjoy your retirement with your wife, Kathy, and your dog. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to say, uh, it doesn't seem like 27 years. Uh, it, it's not so much the work, it's the people I worked with. That's who I really came to work for every day. I mean, we, had, we were such a team, and I think the city still has a good team of people working for it. And uh, those people I'm going to miss, although I'm not going anywhere uh, particularly, I'll be back to, you know, see them once in a while. I told the guys down at the yard that uh, I'll be back to have lunch with them once in a while. I told them to keep my chair empty. I'll be at the table. I'll be back to have lunch with them once in a while. I won't make a nuisance of myself. But I did enjoy working here for 27. I'm going to miss you guys a little bit, but I'm going to have some fun, too. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next, we have public comments. Anyone from the public care to comment on anything that's on the agenda? Mr. Rodas, can you please read the rules? Yeah, the uh, opportunity to comment on items that are not on the agenda. And, and no comment shall be made related to the personal life or personal qualities of any person. And no language which would offend persons of ordinary sensibility shall be permitted. Non agenda items only. Thank you. Anyone from the public care to speak? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Name, address, city and state, please. I'm city and state. Uh, Richard Rosenzweig, 97 Farnham, Judicial Beach, Florida, USA. Uh, what I want to say is uh, thanks to the city, the way they handled this hurricane, this was such an unusual experience, and, and the depth and the breadth of it and the, and the damage that was inflicted on us was minor compared to some places, but still it has it in, it inconvenienced an awful lot of people and things that went on. And so, again, thank you for a job well done. And uh, this gives us an idea of what to expect in the future, because you're only going to incur some of the same. So thank you very much for what you've done. Thank you. Anyone else from the, uh, the public care to speak? Not, Can yes. I just clarify? It's for, it's for items not, not listed on here, right? That's correct, okay. sir. Yes. Katie Fryer Tog, 418 Southeast 2nd Street. Um, in lieu of everything that's going on, I'm sorry, Deerfield Beach, Florida, 33441. In lieu of everything that is going on in and around the city with the hurricane cleanup, I do want to pull um, a little bit of information that there are some fun things going on around the city. On October 20th, the Rotary Club is having their um, annual golf outing. So if anybody would like to come and participate, you can see me and I'll give you all the information. Um, due to the hurricane, the Kiwanis golf outing got rescheduled for October 28th. If anybody's interested in golfing or participating, you can also see me about that. And the last thing is what I'm looking forward to is a Fall Fest coming up on October 21st, sponsored by the city at Pioneer Park. It's going to be a great time, and we need as many families to come out and celebrate fall with us. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Lee, 4311 Crystal Lake Drive, Deerfield Beach, Florida. Uh, it's very interesting to know about these golf outings that are coming about. Uh, I would like to ask where the uh, location will be, uh, which golf courses these uh, outings will be played. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the public care to speak? My, my name is Joe Hines. I'm at 559 Northwest 47th Terrace. So I have a hand out.
Before you, uh, the first page, page number one, is a uh, Florida statute regarding uh, millage rate and setting a millage rate. And, and underlined down there in the, in the red, it says not less than 75 or 95 percent of the taxable value, uh, valuable, uh, value will be used for the millage rate. When you go to the second page, page two, uh, you see in red circle down there, that's your 95 percent millage rate calculation. Uh, when you go to page three, you'll see a different number entered on page three at the top of the line, uh, about $1.6 million less. So um, that, um, that's a different number than what the 95% calculation is, which the law requires. Um, when you go over to page four, you will see, this is interesting, um, you'll see um, since the year 2006, um, got it circled in red, and it shows that that 95% calculation was used throughout all those years, but all of a sudden, in 2013, 2014, never made a change. Um, the city started deducting uh, and, and submitting less than that 95% to our budget. And if you look at each one of those years, that number, that 95% number actually is a 91.85% uh, the first year. This present year is 91.18%. Uh, that is well below the 95% which the law allows. That is from your budgets, and, and you can bring it up on any time you like. Um, the, the purpose of the law said, at, uh, back to that first page, it said not less than, well, 95 percent, and 91 point some is a lot less than that. I believe the city is in violation of the uh, law. Uh, the city complied with the law up until 2013, 2014, as your own records indicate. And I have given you the breakdown there on page four to show you those years, and you can bring up those budgets just like I did, and so can any citizen in this city. Um, I would like to know a couple of things, uh, and, and uh, we have the, uh, the manager was here at that time, the finance director was here at that time, and so were a couple of the, uh, of, of the commissioners. I don't know if the commissioners knew about this, I don't know what the intent of this was, or what the background of this was, but uh, this is, looks to me like it's a clear violation of law because the law says not, shall not, uh, didn't say may can. Um, I would like to uh, maybe uh, you folks give, have the manager bring the finance director up here and give us an explanation as to what this was all about and why we're being shortage on our milling rate and we're not being complied with what the law dictates. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the public here to speak? I'm going to close the public portion to be heard. City manager, do you want to have time to review this or do you want to bring up staff now to talk about this? Well, we just received this, so we'll okay. have to go through and see where it came from. Mr. Hines, we will get an answer for you regarding this. Um, Ms. Williams, we don't want to have you here any longer than you need to be. Would you like to have a picture, or would you like to just go on your merry way? We will leave that up to you. I'm fine listening. Excellent. I'm Thank you. Um, our she wants hearings. to do a picture. First item, item number six. Uh, actually, uh, I apologize. I'm going to have it. If the commission could please step to the side, and we'll do a picture of Miss Williams, please. clear out before we start on to the next item thank you for giving us that indulgence uh, it, I found it best to not let somebody who's holding a bat wait too long so. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Marotis. Item number six, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Deerfield Beach, Florida, amending the City of Deerfield Beach Future Land Use Plan map designation on approximately 109.06 acres of property located at 3810 Crystal Lake Drive and 3941 Northwest 9th Avenue from regular commercial and residential high to residential irregular, providing a severability clause providing an effective date. Good evening, uh, Dennis Mealy, 200 East Broward Boulevard, Fort Lauderdale, on behalf of the applicant. Uh, Mayor and Commissioners, we have a few slides we'd like to show. Um, Mr. Powell, is it ready to go? Thank you. Uh, excuse me for one minute. It always seems to happen. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So I'm sure this will look familiar to you. Uh, this is fairly the same presentation we had at our first reading, but there's some additional information to present. So the first thing is just an aerial photograph showing the location of the site uh, in the center of the picture with the blue star. Go to the next slide, please. And uh, because uh, when we do land use plan amendments, we, are, we look at the impact on all facilities and services, one of the things we often we have to look at on these amendments is the local schools that children from the uh, area would attend. And so you were showing the three locations of schools in the area. Next one. This is the uh, land use map, and we're showing the area to be changed. It's the area in green with the star in the middle. And then you see around it the colors of the uh, land uses around us. So, for example, where you see those orange and brown colors, uh, those are uh, higher densities than we would be. And even the yellow colors at the uh, five units per acre is a higher density than what we would be. And then you see the current land use designation, uh, the current zoning designation, and the proposed land use and zoning designations as well. Go to the next slide, please. So this is the uh, master plan that we prepared at the beginning of the process, and we have since filed our applications for rezoning and site plan, and so what you will see is still consistent with what we're showing here. Um, the uh, main access point is off of Military Trail. Of course, that was not part of the golf course. We, uh, purchased, we are purchasing an additional lot so that we can have access directly out to Military Trail, secondary access point, is on to Crystal Lake Drive. Uh, we recognized when we first started the process that putting all of the traffic on Crystal Lake Drive would not be a good solution, so we actually are purchasing a, an older building uh, on uh, Military Trail where we'll demolish that building and put our main access point there. Uh, this will be a gated community. Uh, the gate will be set back off the roadway of sufficient distance so that there'll be adequate stacking within our own road without people having to stack up out onto Military Trail. You notice that we've also put water around the site because as we had meetings with our neighbors, uh, we learned that, number one, they wanted to have security, and we thought that was a good idea. Uh, we thought we should do that too. And we often find when we replace a golf course view with a water view, it is actually helpful to the property values of our property, but also the property values of the surrounding property. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. By the way, if you have questions at any point along the way, please uh, feel free to, to interrupt and I'll try to answer them. Um, so this is the typical perimeter. So you see um, on the left are the uh, proposed homes that we will be building. You see the, uh, the, the green buffer areas. Now we're not showing all the trees that will be there. We're just kind of showing the, the green buffer areas, the lake, uh, and then also buffers on the opposite side of the lake next to the existing homes. So we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we also look at the fiscal impact of these land use plan amendments. So uh, we had a report that we submitted uh, when we first applied. And so this first uh, slide is showing you recurring annual revenue to the city uh, for a variety of sources. Now, since we prepared this slide, it may be that some of these numbers have changed. I know you recently had your budget hearings and you looked at your fire assessments and your millage rates and everything else. These are the numbers that were in effect 
for last year. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. And then we also have one-time revenues to the city for impact fees and connection fees um, and all of those sorts of things and building permit fees. And so you see those uh, one-time revenues of almost $4 million. If we can go to the next slide. We also um, have one-time revenues to the county uh, for their impact fees for transportation and parks. And I know you have one of the large uh, county parks in your city. Uh, and of course, the transportation, uh, the county is responsible for some of the main roads. The city would be responsible for the local streets. So we're providing uh, revenue for those uh, items as well. And then you see at the bottom the school impact fees that we will pay. Now that number at the bottom is probably going to go up fairly significantly. The county school board is in the process of redoing their school impact fees, which they do periodically, and they're raising them fairly much across the board. So that number will, will most assuredly be higher. And keep in mind that the fees we pay are the fees in effect on the date we pull a building permit. So you might pay more for your last building permit than you do for your first one because each year these rates go up on October 1st of each year. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, these are the uh, annual revenues for all taxing jurisdictions for our area, the city, the county, the school board, the Children's Services Council, the hospital district, the uh, Florida Inland Navigation District, and the South Florida Water Management District. So you see they're fairly uh, significant numbers. Go to the next slide, please. So one of the most important things that I think we did on this project was our community outreach. So on these next two slides, I just want to show uh, what we did and how we progressed. So all of the community meetings are in red and all of the official government meetings are in black. And so you see in our first uh, community meeting, which was held at the Crystal Lake Clubhouse, and the reason we held these meetings at the clubhouse is because that made it closer to all of our neighbors and it was convenient and the clubhouse had enough room to accommodate anyone who wanted to attend. And you see the numbers that we had. Uh, we had 30 neighbors and HOA representatives at our first meeting. We had 60 neighbors and HOA representatives at our second meeting. Um, then uh, let me skip over the Planning and Zoning Board and keep with those red uh, uh, indicated ones. We had approximately 80 people at our third meeting, 20 at our fourth. And then we had a fifth meeting specifically with the Serenity Place HOA because they asked us to come out and meet with them and talk about our project. In addition to that, you see the various public hearings. The land use amendment process is the, uh, of all the governmental approval processes for land development, it's the one that requires the most study, the most hearings, the most public input. And it is the precursor to everything else that you do afterwards, like zoning and platting and site planning and those types of things. So we had a planning and zoning board meeting on July 7th of 2016. The planning and zoning board did recommend approval of the amendment. We had our first reading of the ordinance at City Commission in October, I'm sorry, in September of last year, and it was also recommended for approval there. Then we had four meetings at the county, two with the Broward County Planning Council, uh, which is comprised of municipal elected officials and private citizens from around the county. Your mayor is a member, your city attorney is the attorney for that board. Um, and um, we received uh, recommendations of approval from the Broward County Planning Council on two separate occasions uh, in uh, March and in June. And then the county commission voted twice, so they have to do these ordinances twice as you do, and they recommended uh, approval unanimously on April 25th, and then the final approval was granted by the county commission on August 22nd. Uh, in between uh, the April 25th meeting and the June 22nd meeting of the County Commission on April 25th and the Planning Council on June 22nd, uh, this was reviewed by all the state agencies that comment on these amendments. The Department of Economic Opportunity, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Water, South Florida Water Management District, and a whole variety of other agencies, and they had no negative comments on the application. And that state review was undertaken both for your land use amendment and the one at the county. Both of the amendments are the same. In both cases, we're going from commercial recreation to residential uh, for the 415 units. Uh, but the state reviews both of them separately. And there were no negative comments on either of the applications. Um, if we can go to the next page, please. Now, I'd like to take a minute to talk about the National Golf Foundation. And the reason I'm bringing this up, at many of our earlier hearings, we had uh, people attending that talked about 
the viability of golf courses. And our golf course is doing well. Are there a lot of golfers still out there to play? So the National Golf Foundation is an organization uh, that's founded in 1936. It's based in Jupiter, Florida. And it is, the, it is a support organization for the golf course industry. Uh, they do independent research, market analysis, surveys. Um, and their members are golf courses, golf clubs, uh, associations, and media and other golf-related businesses. Um, so they're an independent organization that is comprised of uh, companies that are in the golf course business. So they are an advocacy group for the golf course industry. And they study uh, the trends in golf course demand and supply. And so what they found is, for example, uh, between 2015 to 2016, 211 golf courses closed in the United States and only 15 new ones opened. And they expect this trend to continue and into the future. We've all read, I think, recently in the Sun Sentinel articles about golf courses closing around the county. And but this is not only something in Broward, it's not only something in Florida, it's a nationwide trend that's continuing. Go to the next slide, please. Um, the uh, states that have the highest number of golf courses, Florida, by far, has the highest number of golf courses of any state in the nation. More than California, more than Texas, more than New York. And so some of those states, although they have higher populations than we do, we have more golf courses than they do. And the top five states for golf courses closing are led by the state of Florida. We've had more closures here than any other state in the country. And it was followed by California, Texas, and Michigan. And the National Golf Foundation 2017 report says that, that we expect this trend to continue. As they said, golf remains oversupplied. There's more courses than there are demand for play. Uh, one of the other things that's happened in Broward County, as the number of golfers has declined, many of the private courses have become public courses. So there are now more places to play, but less people playing. And that has stimulated more closures. Um, uh, I heard a uh, number from the gentleman who ran the Crystal Lake Golf Course that in 2010, they had approximately 63,000 rounds uh, that year. By 2015, they were down to 47,000 rounds. And that decline has continued since 2015. So the result, while you still have the same cost to operate a golf course with all the maintenance and the personnel and everything, the revenue is declining to the point where you're now losing money on a regular basis. In fact, my client, Mr. Hoyer, has been subsidizing the operation of the course all during the time that we've had this application in process. If we could go to the next slide, please. So this just shows the uh, declining golf participation. And the National Golf Foundation does surveys of golfers. And this, these are their numbers that in 2011, we had 25.7 million golfers. And by 2016, we were down to 23.8. Also during that time, two things happened. Number one, the definition of what is a golfer changed. Um, in 2011, uh, you had to play, I believe it was 10 times a year at least, to be counted as a golfer. Now, if you play three times a year, you're counted as a golfer. So not only have the numbers declined, but the definition of who counts as a golfer has gotten much more lenient because you don't have to play as often to still be counted. Um, I'd like to, uh, that's all I have in terms of the slides. I'd like to cover a couple of other things quickly. If I could give this to the clerk and ask that you each take one and pass it down, I'm going to refer to these letters. So with me tonight is uh, Stefan Hoyer, my client, and sitting next to Stefan is Dan Grosswald. Stefan and Dan will be working on this project together. Stefan and Dan um, have been building a new development in the city of Pembroke Pines that is at the site of a former golf course. So we have four pieces of correspondence I'd like to talk to you about tonight. I'll wait until you each have one. So the first one is a letter from the mayor of Pembroke Pines. And it's addressed to your mayor. I'll just read it quickly. I know you can see it, but so the audience can hear it as well. 
So this, May, uh, this letter is dated September 27, 2017. The Honorable Bill Gans, Mayor of Deerfield Beach, uh, gives the address of City Hall regarding Hoyer Homes. Dear Bill, I understand that Stefan Hoyer is proposing a new residential development in the City of Deerfield Beach. Mr. Hoyer is building a residential development in the City of Pembroke Pines on the former Rain Tree Golf Course. Stefan worked extremely hard with our city and with the neighboring residents of the Rain Tree property. When he first started on the project, neighbors were very concerned. By the time we reached the final approval process for the Rain Tree development, neighbors came to the City Commission to express their support for the project. They told us that Mr. Hoyer delivered on every promise he made. The city is also very pleased with the result. We hope Stefan will come back to Pembroke Pines for another development project. If you have any questions, please call me at your convenience. Sincerely, Frank C. Ortis, Mayor, City of Pembroke Pines. The second uh, is an uh, email, and this is from the president of one of the associations that borders the Rain Tree Golf Course. Her name is Susan Schwartz. Um, dear Mr. Stefan Hoyer, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your interest and help in addressing the concerns of Heron's Landing, that's the name of her association, uh, throughout the development of the Rain Tree Project. It is quite understandable that when a large building project is going on nearby, there's going to be a disruption of the surrounding community's peace and tranquility. During the initial stages of the Rain Tree Project, I, as a board member of the Heron Landing Townhomes HOA, presented you with several issues related to noise, aesthetics, and other adverse conditions impacting our community. After presenting you with these issues, you assured me that they would be addressed immediately and a remedy would be found. In every case, you put forth a good faith effort to address our concerns and had an appropriate resolution implemented until each issue was fixed to our complete satisfaction. I realized from the beginning when I met you for the first time that you are a man of great integrity and have a real concern regarding the impact of your projects on neighboring communities. Your actions have demonstrated a, two, a true understanding and compassion for others. I, as well as my neighbors in Heron's Landing, greatly appreciate your efforts to accommodate our needs while developing the land and building the Rain Tree Project. I am thankful that it was you who purchased the land and planned the project, and I feel fortunate that you are still very much involved. The Rain Tree community includes high class and aesthetically pleasing homes with beautiful landscaping, which also adds to the property value of homes in the surrounding communities. I see it as a win-win situation. Thank you for continuing to be involved in the completion of the project. We all feel comfortable knowing that Stefan Hoyer is at the helm. Sincerely, Susan Schwartz, Board Director, Harry and Flange and HOA. I only have two more and they're, they're a little shorter. I'll, I'll proceed faster. The next email is from Henry Rose, who is the Chairman of the Planning and Zoning Board in the City of Pembroke Pines and is also in the neighboring uh, Eagle Creek uh, development adjacent to Rain Tree in Pembroke Pines. Uh, Henry wrote this on September 27th. My family decided to buy a home in Pembroke Pines in 1987 in the Eagle Creek development, which was adjacent to the Rain Tree Golf Course. 30 years have passed and things have changed. Golfing as recreation and a sport has declined, and our city and area could not support five golf courses. When Stefan Hoyer wanted to develop the residential, as residential, the golf course, which was abandoned and fallow for many years, there was, of course, a lot of concern from residents, including myself, in the six developments that border the property. Moreover, I am fortunate to serve as an appointed official as the chair of the City of Pembroke Pines Planning and Zoning Board since 2001. And I can state without qualification that Mr. Hoyer and his representative, Dennis Mealy, I didn't know he was going to put my name in there, uh, were open, honest, and completely approachable throughout the entire planning and zoning process. Finally, I can say equivalent, uh, unequivocally that these two gentlemen were a pleasure to work with at each and every step from zoning to variances to site plan. Uh, signed, Henry A. Rose. And then last, uh, this is a letter from Paul D. Rubenstein, who is the attorney who represents the current owners. Remember that Mr. Hoyer and Mr. Grosswald are purchasing this property. And I won't read this letter in detail, but the bottom line is what the attorney for the current owners is saying is that the course is going to close whether the land use amendment goes forward or not because they're losing too much money. And you can read it uh, for those details. Um, I also want to put a couple of things on the record. Um, when we came in uh, at the first reading, we made certain commitments, and I want to assure you that we're following through on those commitments and how we're going about doing it. So first, you may remember that we were asked to uh, enter into an agreement with the city 
that if a traffic signal was warranted at Military Trail and Southwest 15th Street, that we would pay for it. We would design it, we would permit it, and we would build it. And we've already signed an agreement to that effect, and it's in the process of being recorded. So if there was a traffic signal needed at that location, uh, we would pay for it. Uh, second, um, as conditions of our rezoning and site plan, you will see the following items incorporated into our plan. First, uh, we had agreed, and uh, Mr. Powell, can we go back to the slide that shows the development plan? I think it was probably the fourth slide. There we go. Um, so you see near the entrance uh, to the uh, development, uh, those the green areas, and then there's a little yellow area between the two green areas, right by the entrance off of Crystal Lake Drive. When we first came into the city, we were advised by the city administration that you need faster response times for 911 calls for EMS so that the people in the area will receive that service more promptly. And so we agreed to dedicate the site for and to build an EMS station. And so that station would go right near that entrance at Crystal Lake Drive so it could serve not only our development but all of the surrounding community. And so as a condition of our rezoning and site plan, we are entering into an agreement to provide for us to dedicate the land for the station and build the station. This is somewhat similar to what we did at the old Deerfield Country Club site where Mr. Butters agreed to dedicate the site for and build the community building, which has since been built. So we're working with your staff on the details of that building, but we will be dedicating the land and building that building. Uh, secondly, your Public Works Department has asked for a flowage easement through the property so that areas around the site that need drainage, the drainage can go through our lake system and then out to Crystal Lake uh, as, as permitted by the Water Management District. So we're also providing for that flowage easement. In fact, it is already shown on the site plan drawings that we've submitted to the city. Um, we were also asked uh, to put in a turn lane at Green Road and uh, 49th Street if right away is available. We've agreed to do that as well. We've drafted an agreement that will be attached to the rezoning and site plan to provide for that improvement. Um, I'd also was asked about drainage generally. There are a number of neighborhoods. Uh, Mr. Powell, could we go, uh, could we slide that down a little bit so you could see the neighborhood to our north? Is that possible to do? Uh, it's right at, right where the, there we go. You notice how uh, the lake system at the top of the drawing in the center, there is a development that kind of comes into that area. Um, they need more drainage. And we were asked, would we provide flowage easements for that area? And we said we would, and that's on our plans as well. And just to give you a feel for what we're talking about, currently on the site, there's about four and a half acres of lake. When we're done with this plan, we'll have over 26 acres of lake. And our engineer has told me that the standard procedure with the South Florida Water Management District and the Broward County EPD, both of which issue drainage permits for this area, we have to demonstrate that post-development, we have more drainage capacity than pre-development. So this area will drain faster and better after we put all these lakes in than it does today. Now, I know we had a big rain event in June. I don't know how it was in this neighborhood. I know it was bad in many parts of the county. Uh, but it will drain better when we're done uh, than it does today. Uh, other than that, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And at the end of the public comment period, I'd like the opportunity to respond as appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any comments from the commissioner before we open it up to the public? Commissioner Battle? I just have a couple of questions. Uh, 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 you mentioned that uh, in the study that new courses, uh, 15 were open. Do you happen to know whether or not uh, these courses were funded by the city, the counties, or all these private? Um, the uh, National Golf Foundation study did not specify uh, whether they were public or private. None, either on the 211 that closed or the 15 that opened, they didn't specify who, who owned them. Uh, did they talk any more about the number of courses perhaps that have closed in Florida? Um, let me look at the report and see if I can get you that number. When I come back up, I'll, I'll try to respond. And, and the last one, how many private uh, have become public? Uh, between 2010 and 2015, it was my understanding that five private courses in Broward County became public. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Drosky. 
I, I just have one question for Mr. Mealy, and I, I think I know the answer based upon the letter from Paul Rubenstein that we received. But if the land use amendment were not granted, does your client intend to operate the property going forward as a golf course? No. Thank Any you. other comments, Commissioner? No, not at this time. Okay. Mr. Mealy, the, yes, sir. Uh, I, I won the okay. five. I just wanted to see you go back and forth. Uh, of the, you said that there were several that had gone from uh, private to public. Can you name those golf courses? Uh, Woodmont, Woodlands, Parkland Golf and Country Club, and I can't remember the other two. Uh, Woodmont and Woodlands are in Tamarack, Parkland Golf and Country Club in Parkland. Um, oh, I believe Eagle Trace also went public during that same time frame. Cool. And if I look at my chart, I might be able to figure out the fifth one. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to open up to the public. Do from the public like to speak? Just to give your name, address, uh, city and state, please. Good evening. My name is Martin Osborne, 2040 Northwest 34th Avenue, Coconut Creek, Florida. I've been playing at Crystal Lake Country Club for over 15 years. As, as you um, probably know, they purchased the property um, and closed one of the courses already, right? Oh, hold on. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. If we could have everyone, please. Uh, I'm sorry. We made a line at the No problem. We'll just have you come up. So you just pause the time, please, okay. gentlemen. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so I've been playing at that course for quite some time. Um, I'll just quickly say that recently there's been mismanagement at that course, and that's why their um, number of players have dropped. And I'd say over the last about 18 months, they got a new greenskeeper who's done a wonderful job. That place is now packed. So sometimes statistics can be misleading. A lot of the statistics I heard the gentleman speaking about, I would say, were misleading. I think also there's been nothing discussed about the quality of life um, for residents. They're only talking about a little bit about developing in the bottom line and how much money you're going to be going get, but um, there's a long-standing comment that they pave paradise and put up a parking lot. How much longer are you going to continue paving over Broward County? It, nobody, I bet all of you didn't move here when you saw this place and it looked like a parking lot. You moved here when it was beautiful and it was open and it wasn't congested. And this one, the, they've done the land use and they're trying to tell you that it's not going to add any congestion, but you have to look at these things in the cumulative. And this one little one and then another development, there's basically nothing left. If you drive on Hillsboro at around 5 o'clock now, that other property that they developed, it's creating a traffic jam over there. The same thing is going to happen. I would urge you to drive by Crystal Lake at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning and take a look at the parking lot and see how many people are actually using that property. And then go by on the weekends and see what's going on. And then also just look on um, Hills on uh, Sample and also on Military and see the congestion that's going on now. You're just adding to it. It's not. You can't just look at it solely. You need to look at it in the in the um, cumulative. Lastly, I just want to say that really, I think one of your primary um, roles is the quality of life for your current residents. And to just be looking at the bottom line, I don't think really does the job. Eventually, you're going to have developed every every open space left in the in the town, and then you're going to have to figure out how to how to maximize the value of already developed land. I would suggest that you do that now and stop all of this development. Bulldozing another golf course is not the right answer. Thank you very much. I oppose this. Thank you. Good evening, Commission. Evening. My name is Barbara Tiffin, 3910 Crystal Lake Drive, uh, Pompano, uh, Deerfield Beach, Florida, 33064. Um, one of the first things I'd like to bring up is infrastructure. I don't know how many of you have paid a visit to Crystal Lake Drive. We are a simple two-lane road. There are no stripes on it. We have no curbs. Um, people can drive on the grass. We have insufficient lighting. Uh, we are definitely a curved street, and around the entrance to the golf course is a very, very difficult area. Without sufficient um, city-sponsored street lighting, we have the lights from our, our parking lots in our condo buildings. 
Um, but you're, you've got people that are walking in the street, pushing buggies, coming home um, with, with bicycles, with, with grocery bags. Um, we have no curbs and no street drainage. We have no street drains. The drains don't start till you get all the way down to 45th Street. Absolutely nothing from military through us. That water just goes into our grass, and that's how it seeps down. So I'm sorry, but you folks have a lot of new infrastructure. Where the golf course community house is, there is a huge compound of housing currently being um, uh, constructed. And now, mind you, these new constructions, they're six stories tall. They're five and six stories tall. Most of our condominiums stop at three and four levels. So now we have these huge towering things that totally break our view. And obviously, this is lake. What they showed on their map about all this green space, the, the golf course is green. This is lake. We, we can't use the lake. That's not public space for us. Now, all of these apartments and condominiums along the road, they were built as condominiums. And now they are being rentals. Florida law has changed, and it's no longer the snowbird things. So current owners that don't come here are renting year-round to families. There isn't a single place here for children to play. I watch children learning how to ride a bicycle in the golf course's parking lot. Kids practicing their soccer kicks. Um, I mean, skateboarding. There is no place for them to go, and neither is there a safe place for them to walk. Uh, we do not have connecting sidewalks all down Crystal Lake Drive. You can walk maybe uh, partway down, but then you're walking in the street, and that goes both ways. Now, I'm sorry, but you have these two huge developments. Now, you're talking about impact fees. $1.35 million for water and sewer. Okay, have we seen any improvements at all? Where's the money from all of this? You'd think we could buy a, a, build a little emergency service center somewhere on here. You have three to 5,000 people living in these condominium buildings on this street. And nobody knows about us. When I've, you, you want to talk about crime coming up? I've caught in kids stealing a, a motorcycle from the parking lot across the street, taking it behind my building to steal it. I actually called Broward Sheriffs. They came and arrested the children. Ma'am, would you like an additional minute? Uh, yes, please. Sure. Okay, so infrastructure is really big. Um, city services, all this new construction that's going up, I don't have anybody that I can call at City Hall. I have left messages for the building par departments. You know, they don't hose down the property. All of their dust and dirt is in our pool. You might not notice it. I'm the tiny little building right next to this entrance that all these streets are going to lead to. This tiny little dot there is our pool. We own green space. The whole lot now next to us is a swimming pool and green space. The only other green space is connected to the halfway house across the street and there's a little stand of pine trees. So we have a lake, we have three little lots that are privately owned by the condo units for green space and then the golf course is going to be full of houses and all of this traffic. This cannot be the main entrance for three roads on our little street. That is unacceptable. What about this whole area here on 45th Street? What about this entrance? Aren't they going to develop that entrance? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Al Rickey, 4100 Crystal Lake Drive, and I am on the ninth hole of the golf course at Crystal Lake. I'm appalled, and Mr. Melly knows me well. I have been studying the viability of nine whole golf courses, and I find that they are very viable, and they are profit-making. And yes, 18 whole golf courses have their problems, as we know. But nine whole golf courses, and I never heard Mr. Melly mention it once, are very viable. I call 15 different owners of nine hole golf courses in Florida. I went to South Carolina where the Mecca is at, uh, at a beach there where they have lots of nine hole golf courses. Nine hole golf courses are successful because the 65 year old people and above don't have the stamina to get out there and play 18 holes. A lot of them don't have the health, but they love their golf. Our golfers here right now 
are ordinary people that can't afford to go the big distances. They're going to have to go to play golf right now if this is taken away from us. These are the, the, the policemen, the firemen, the uh, teachers, the bartenders, common people that aren't being considered one iota. Now, let me say this, that the state and the local governments are hurting financially. They naturally want their land developed so they can reap the harvest. But don't disregard and don't have show no compassion for our golfers. The way you're thinking right now is that all golf courses should be shut down in Florida. Think about it. Now, Mr. Hoyer, I think is going to build us the most beautiful development there could be. And I'm for it. I've realized that it's a lost cause, that the development's going to take place. I, I, and I encourage it. And I think he's a very honorable person. Mr. Hoyer came here to build houses. He didn't want to get involved in golf courses naturally. He's got an investment to make. He's got to build the houses, and everybody wants him to build the houses so that he will provide a lot of money for them. And I'm for that, too, because with, when the states and the local governments have money, they can employ people, and I'm for that. So what I'm asking is that a concerted effort be, got, be, be had by the city to do something about what's about to happen. That's all I ask for. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. I, st I, st I have to do say something important. The expert on nine hole golf courses is John Miller, and his telephone number is 305 947 1741. I urge you to talk to him, and especially if anybody's in this room from the press, I urge them to talk to him about the nine-hole golf courses, the viability of it. Thank you, Mr. Rickey. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Barbara Moriarty. I live at 617 Emerald Way West in Deerfield Beach. As a resident of Deerfield Beach, and Crystal Lake golfer. I've known this golf course since its beginning. I strongly oppose approval of this land use change. I cannot think of a single reason why this would benefit, now I'm talking about Deerfield Beach residents, especially those who purchase property on or near this course. Open space, especially space offering residents an opportunity to participate in a lifetime individual sport while enjoying the outdoors is a commodity that once it is gone, it's gone for good. Our infrastructure will suffer, quality of life will deteriorate, and I believe property values will be lower. Values will be lower, especially for those who unfortunately purchase property in the Crystal Lake community. I was once a resident of this community. I have empathy for those who still live there. The purpose of our city government is the betterment of the quality of life for its citizens. Boca Raton has recently chosen to invest in the conversion of a 27-hole golf course into a municipal golf course. It's going to be called Boca National Golf Club. I, applaud, I applaud them for this decision. In the coming years, I believe many of the new retirees moving to Florida will gravitate to those communities offering amenities such as golf courses, along with other leisure activities. While Deerfield has many facilities for recreation, including the beach, although they are of great value, many, if not most, of these are oriented to the younger population. Yet, according to the 2010 census statistics, 80% of our population is over 18. Um, and one out of five residents are over 65. The percentage is actually, this is from the census, the percentage is actually 21.47, or 16,104 residents. So I'm thinking in terms of recreation for these people. Deerfield Beach, I, I, um, Deerfield Beach once had five, five golf courses. 
If this land use is approved, there will be only one from five to one. Please do not allow that to happen in our city. Vote no. Do the right thing and protect the quality of life in Deerfield Beach. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Linda Trotter. Uh, address is 1270 Northwest 47th Street, Deerfield Beach. My number one reason for not wanting this project is simply the traffic situation. Crystal Lake Drive going on to Military Trail will be impossible, not to mention the added traffic on Military Trail itself and Sample Road. Crystal Lake Golf Villas, Phase 1 and Phase 2, already had to beg the city for two to three years to get traffic calming devices on Northwest 45th Street, Northwest 13th Drive, and Northwest 18th Avenue. Vehicles are constantly cutting through our communities since Green Wiles Road opened. On an average morning, I have to wait 10 minutes to make a left turn onto Green and Wiles to go west. Now, if this housing project gets approved and if Century Village's defunct golf course gets approved for that housing project, then Military Trail and Southwest 10th will just be a highway itself jammed up. We already have a new large rental development on Crystal Lake Drive that just recently opened and yet another large rental development just east that is now under construction. The, neither one, I mean, the one that's already open hasn't even been filled up yet. They have still so many vacant apartments so that when it's filled in this other development and then this project, I'd like to know if anyone has taken the time to add up what the potential numbers of all possible vehicles with these three new housing projects could be. So if one will allow three cars per unit, some have two, all these need to be added up plus all the homes and the townhouses that they're projecting to build. If this has not been done, I urge you to get these figures. I don't believe any of you live in this area and you're not going to be effective daily. Well, we do and we don't like it. So unless we have the traffic studies in place, I have to ask you to vote no. I have absolutely nothing against the developers at all. It's just my concern is with the traffic. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dave Morantz. I live at 9841 Riverside Drive, Coral Springs, Florida. Um, it's been my a pleasure to be uh, on the board of the Chamber of Commerce of Deerfield Beach since 2010. And I currently am the um, chair of the Government Relations Committee for the Deerfield Beach, Beach Chamber of Commerce. Just a, a couple of clarifications. A reference was made between public and private courses. Um, the courses that were mentioned were all privately owned courses that had membership and that members decided to not allow the public, but they were owned um, by an individual company. There's been only one golf course that I'm aware of that is now municipally owned that was privately owned and, you know, for instance, Woodlands and Woodmont are still privately owned, but their members couldn't keep the uh, the golf courses for themselves, so the ownership tried to uh, elected to uh, open them to the public, but they're still privately owned. They run as businesses, and they um, unfortunately have to deal with the laws of the marketplace as well. Um, it's uh, Colony West is the only course that I'm aware of in Broward County that a municipality took over the running of it. Just as a um, and the mention of the wonderful stuff that Boca Municipality is planning. But what the what wasn't mentioned is that their existing public facility on the corner of Hillsborough Boulevard, excuse me, um, Glades and the Turnpike, that's going to be sold and that's going to be turned into houses and then they're converting um, 
an older golf course into the new municipal site. So in, to my knowledge, Deerfield never had any municipal owned golf courses. These were all privately owned companies that ran a business and um, this is an issue of land, land rights. You know, and I don't think anybody here has asked the city or the city is contemplating purchasing this golf course and running it as a business in a deficit. So I just as a clarification. Um, just you know, one of the, the city of Deerfield Beach um, is up until last year was the only city of its size in the South Florida that didn't have a, um, a formal economic development study and plan. In the previous commission, after being approached by the com business community, spent the money and time to do a study for the long-term development of this community, and that was presented as a benchmark to this to the commission and was adopted last August. And the point of that whole plan was to identify strengths and weaknesses of the community. And one of the mission critical weaknesses was new housing stock in the city of Deerfield Beach. It's been a new housing development for 25 years. And so when we talk about millage rate, what we really need to talk about is tax base. And those houses are all going to be, are, 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 these are not easy decisions. By the way, I, I would like another minute if I may, please. Um, yes, I'll keep sure. it to 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, on a personal note, you know, those of you who know me, I have two passions. My six stepchildren and, and, and my grandchildren, and I probably play about 45 rounds of golf a year. It's what I do. Um, it's where I get my enjoyment. It's the only reason I try to stay in shape so I can swing a golf club another day. This is not about my personal passions. It's about the long-term um, uh, plan of our city. And so as we are trying to compete with other communities in South Florida and the country to bring businesses here to build that tax rate, we need to focus on seven areas. One of those areas was um, um, housing stock. So it's a not an easy decision, um, but I think the, uh, it's one that um, if you follow the plan that you adopted, um, you have a, um, a compass to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Stefan Hoyer, 111 Southwest 3rd Street, Miami, Florida. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Honorable Commissioners, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, I'm the applicant of uh, tonight, and um, Mr. Mealy had pointed out a lot of the, the facts about our, our, our development. So um, what I really want to tell you, though, is that um, if you allow this project to move forward tonight, I promise you that I will be engaged with the community in many, many years down the road. Uh, listen to what existing and new residents uh, desire and what is needed and work as much as I can to make this a, a, a pleasure for everyone involved. Um, I also want to uh, apologize that we're not able to to uh, satisfy everybody's uh, request so far, uh, but if I can bring up a couple of things to the young lady who was, the, I think, the second speaker, um, mentioned something that's also very dear to my heart, uh, where, uh, being a father of two children, of where those kids have a, a place to, to play and to, to, to be kids. And unfortunately, a golf course is not a safe place for, for children to play already. Uh, and golf courses are generally should at least only be limited to people playing, playing that game. Um, but what we're in our dedication, of, in our land use amendment, we're dedicating over three and a half acres of land. And, and if, ma'am, if you would like to work uh, with so me. Sir, Mr. Hoyer, you're uh, going to have to address the commission. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And if the lady who, um, who brought up the, the, the point of open space, if she would like to uh, work with me uh, to see how we can make the best use out of this uh, public space, I'll be more than happy to, to sit down and work on a plan together. Um, I also would like to uh, say that I worked extensively with Mr. Al Ricky on investigating the viability of a nine-hole golf course. And while I respect Mr. Ricky tremendously, some of the ways that we underwrite the, the, the financials of a golf course differ very much. So thank you very much for tonight, and I'll be here by, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Vincente Thoreau, 1890 Northwest 6th Avenue, Pompano Beach. I'm here tonight to identify that I've had previous experiences in working with the current land use attorney because like, like this city, we have problems with 
when they come in our neighborhoods and talk about the different development projects, water and stuff, um, in particular when he was representing um, one of his clients, Auto House. And I have to tell the people that he really delivers on his words. If he commits and says that he's going to work with the neighborhood, he does. Because you can't get no harder than a one um resident called uh, Reverend Lester when you talk about things that need to be done. And when she say she wants to see a resident um, not have to worry about water issues or retention issues in back our communities, they, they, they took care and took care of that. Now, I'm going to be honest, Mayor. Uh, the concessions that I saw tonight, Mayor Commission, were awesome. Because in Pompano Beach, we run a deficit with our golf course. Don't nobody want to have a golf course as a municipal golf course right now. I think our, our golf course costs us almost $500,000 in a hole. So I understand what the people are saying when it comes to golf courses, but if they really understood the financials of what it takes to maintain a golf course, it is not profitable, at least to us, in the neighboring city. So I think, commissioners, that you really all should, you should look at the economics of this, also taking the input of the community, and I think this is an awesome project for Deerfield Beach, and I hope that you approve. Thank you. Thank you. That was a decoy we had. <laughs> I always, I always see to the women. I've learned better. Um, my name is Chris Colombo. I live in Idaho's Point. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Your name one more time. Chris Colombo. And uh, living at this point, yeah. and I've been associated with. I'm, I'm so sorry, Mr. Caldwell. You're full. You, you've said your name, but if you just give me your address, City oh, State, please. 2411 Northeast 47th Street, Lighthouse Point. Okay. I've been associated with uh, Deerfield Beach since night. Well, not I personally, me and the family since 1974, and um, and I've seen a transition take place, which really. <laughs> makes me feel good, but it also makes me feel sad. It's been a, too much uh, craziness going on um, with uh, people passing by, uh, a lot of traffic. But what I saw with the plan that um, Mr. Hoyer has pointed out is that he intends to have not just two different entrances, I, I like the schematics, but he also has and I saw a lot of the drainage problems in, La in uh, Deerfield Beach, in Pompano Beach, but I also have some connections there, that uh, baffles me how people can really not want such an improvement. The, the, if this logic of trying to save the property from too much concrete, I cannot see that happen in this area because there is a water body of water all around the property. There's a body of water that actually helps drain four times faster than the existing drainage system. So a lot of this concern is primarily anti anyone who wants to get rid of the golf course and put a development. In reality, they should be happy. I strongly support this type of development because it gives people locally as was initially introduced, waterfront values. You can buy this property at, at, by now probably cheaper than you can five years from now. Uh, so I, I don't want to be the kind of a person who is uh, so nearsighted that I could have cut my own nose to spite my face. So anyone who is against this thing here really should have a, a, an act of conscience. Really look into it. Is it really for us? For me personally, or is it really for everybody? And I think if you do not support this uh, construction, this uh, project, you will cut your nose. So again, let me support this for the whole community. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Kiku Martinson. I live at 2440 Loblolly Lane. I am the managing broker for Campbell and Rosemary Real Estate. As not only myself, but all of our agents, we are excited about this project. We are often asked for new construction versus older construction. 
we're excited about it. We would love to see it in this city. We would love to have it available for sales, for resales. We think it will definitely help the community around there look better, newer, brighter, and we're definitely for it. Thank you. Uh, Frank Vecino, 15 Northeast 2nd Avenue, Deerfield Beach. I'll just keep this brief. I'm just here in support of the project. I think it's something that will be great for the city and the families that will eventually live there. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Freitag, 418 Southeast 2nd Street, um, Deerfield Beach. I hope that with the building, if this does go through and does get passed, that with the building of these new areas, that it will help the other apartments that are along Military Trail step up to the plate. They look very run down. They look very old. They have not. They have piles of garbage out on the street on a regular basis. I hope that maybe this will entice them to step up to the plate if they see that people are renting down the street for the same prices that they're paying for their place, they're going to lose business. Maybe that'll give them some enticement to clean up their act and make the whole entire area look a little bit better. And as mentioned, uh, of the two golf tournaments that I mentioned today, one of them is in Pompano and the other one is at Crystal Lake. Good evening. Yes. My name's Mike Flynick, 1400 Northwest 45th Street, Deerfield, Crystal Lake. I've been a property owner in Crystal Lake 33 years. I'm against the development because, uh, like everyone else says, the traffic's going to be horrendous. I live right on the golf course, got a beautiful view, and I know nobody cares about that. But I'm going to be breathing all that nasty dust from 50 years of a golf course being here with all the pesticides and fertilizer concentrated in the soil. Plus, the golf course has been neglected ever since Cabot. I don't know if you're familiar with Cabot Golf LLC, which is Cabot Investment Properties. The two main guys are in prison right now for 10 years. Did you read about that recently? Anyway, so you're dealing with a couple of crooks as far as who owns the property. And, uh, you know, why is the city of Boca so interested in, in getting a city golf course if it's such a losing business these days and why is the Broward amateur why did they have 70 percent more newer players this year sign up to play in a Broward amateur if it's such a losing you know sport I mean I don't play golf hardly ever anymore I've had five hip surgeries so but I, I live right on the course I'm just concerned about the environmental aspect and, you know, if Cabot wouldn't have neglected the course, they would have probably been profitable over the last 10 years. But I'm sure they probably did it. They bought the property just to eventually develop on it anyway. So they're not golf course owners. Anyway, and this will be the fourth course closed in Deerfield, okay? Four out of 212 nationwide. If you looked at Deerfield on a national map, it's probably a tiny, tiny speck. So why is... 2% of the nation's golf courses being closed in this one little city. Does that make sense? I mean, if, every, if you looked at the whole map of the United States and saw that 2% of the golf courses, this little tiny speck of a town, Deerfield, is closing 2% of the nation's golf course, that just doesn't seem right. You know, you got to keep some area for recreation. And I, I sent everybody an email how I felt. Thank you for answering mine, uh, Mr. Drosky. And uh, Commissioner Bauer, you made a comment a couple months ago about ruining the feel of the community, about putting these big houses next to these little houses, I believe it was, in your neighborhoods. What do you think it's going to do to the feel of this community that's had a golf course for 50 years? You cram 450 houses in the middle of a golf course in an already overcrowded neighborhood. It's going to be a mess. But, you know, I know you guys want the tax revenues, and I'm sure Mr. Hoyer here builds great homes. I was in the concrete construction business for 33 years. Sir, okay. you'll have to address the commission, please. Okay. Anyway, do what you're going to do, but you're making a mistake for the people. Uh, you know, you guys are elected officials. You're supposed to do what's, what the people want, not what your budget wants or what the developer wants. Okay. 
Thank you, sir. Good evening. My name is Barry Daw. I live at 1301 East Hillsborough Boulevard in Deerfield Beach, Florida. I vehemently oppose changing the golf course into more apartments and concrete jungle. Right now, military trail with what is already proposed and being constructed, military trail is not going to be able to handle that traffic as it is now. I think that it the Commission should look at it and say, okay, enough is enough. People are buying properties on speculation, knowing that they can lawyer up, come to you, and you're going to approve it and rubber stamp it and let them do what they want to do anyways. Like other people have said, this should be for the people of Deerfield Beach. There's a lot of people that don't even live in this city. They're making comments about what we should do in our city. They don't live here, don't really think their comments are valid or have any bearing to what the people of Deerfield actually want. The golf course itself is a Reese Jones designed golf course that if they put the money into it, it could actually draw traffic. It's already been stated. The reason that it's not is because it's been getting run down. I've been golfing my whole life, found this place recently and it's a nice little course if they put the money into it they could get a lot of traffic out there they could start charging close to the revenues that deer creek which will be the only remaining golf course in deerfield beach it appears that we have lost four in the last five years that rate is way too high since 2012 is when those four courses since then have closed and been developed. Just want to state I'm very much against it. Uh, don't like the traffic issues. Um, the feasibility studies I haven't seen about the increased traffic on military trail, because also right now you have to take into consideration all the other properties that are being developed and built, because it all snowballs. I live east of Federal. The hotel hasn't even started breaking ground yet. The feasibility studies weren't done, and just the traffic from federal to the intercoastal on a weekend, it's almost like there's no season anymore. So traffic is a huge issue all over this city. And I, I just want to say I'm not I'm not for this construction. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Richard Rosen's Log 97, Farnham, Deerfield Beach. Uh, just to remind people here that. Hold, hold on, Mr. Rosen. Yes, sir. I, I'm going to have to ask for no comments from, from the uh, out in the chamber, please. So, well, respect people who are speaking, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first off, uh, Mr. Hoyer had been running his golf course for a few years by himself, and he'd been running a deficit. So, I don't know where these people are playing golf at if he's running a golf course on a regular basis and losing money, as is most of the golf courses in the area. Secondly, when it comes to building on a golf course, the mitigation that's required by state law, that I think 18 inches of topsoil and stuff have to be removed so there won't be any arsenic and stuff being spread through the air or any breathing problems with that issue. And thirdly, uh, as I recall, and uh, I can be corrected if I'm wrong, but there's several acres that belong to the city in that area that in some near future will be developed into a park for everybody. And so it'll be more green space and more things to do, and that planning will come forward to the people in Crystal Lake to have an input in that project as well. And I'm sure that the state has looked at, and the county has looked at uh, the transportation issues along the military trail and others, and I know that's a horrendous situation. And I'm sure they'll be addressing it. And I think there's an article coming up on our resolutions along that discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the public? Hi, my name is Sam Piccarello. I live at 1221 Southeast 10th Street in Deerfield, and I'm a member of Crystal Lake Golf Course. 
About two years ago, I'd say, the city of Deerfield uh, city ordinance sent me a notice about that I didn't have enough greenery and my property. They wanted me to plant a lawn in the middle of a drought. And of course, I do realize I had some dead plants that I pulled out and I didn't need more greenery. When is Deerfield going to stop cementing Deerfield and leave the greenery green? It's in your city code that you're saying, oh, you know, we need all this carbon um, dioxide from trees and all this to be healthy. Well, you're taking it all away. Deerfield Country Club is gone. Probably Hillsboro, um, what was it, Pines is gone. Now this. And never mind the wildlife. Where does the wildlife go? In somebody's backyard? You know, it, it, it's also, as was mentioned before, the club can make money. The owners choose for it not to make money because they just want to sell it. If they sold it to somebody who knows how to run a golf course, it could make money. And I'm just against it. That's all I have to say. Aside from the traffic issue, which where I live in the Cove is not near Crystal Lake, but when all the developments went up on the beach, if I don't get to Publix by 8 o'clock in the morning during the season, I'm not getting a parking space. And it's not going to be any different out here once they build all these houses. They're going to have the same problem. These people are going to have nowhere to shop. They can't drive. It's horrible. It's horrible where I live. It's going to be horrible out there. Aside from the fact that I want to be able to breathe, when is enough cement enough cement? And again, I think you should take, all of you should take us into consideration. We voted you in. You work for us. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jerry Lee, 4311 Crystal Lake Drive, Unit 302, Deerfield Beach, Florida. The developer's attorney says that uh, he's provided this application and has received no negative comments. Well, I'd like to go to attachment number 17 of the application with the Florida Department of Transportation. Issue number one, lack of strategic intermodal system consulta consultation. Issue number two, level of service deficiencies. There are plenty of contradictions to this, plenty of negative comments from the Florida Department of Transportation to, be, to start off number one. Now I realize that um, my opposition, I've done extensive research on this, so I know a lot what's going on here, and I do oppose this. And I believe, I, I understand that the perception is my op opposition to this is passionate and speculative. Now, I'd like to go to this couple of articles here. February 2nd, 2017, in The Observer, Crystal Lake Golf Club celebrates 52 years. In the Sun Sentinel, golf courses declining as hundreds of homes rise. March 23rd, 2017, a quote from Greg Nathan, the chief director of the National Golf Foundation, for which the developers so much adorn, stated that the decline in golf courses is a natural market correction. He said in a two-decade building boom that started in 1986 produced a glut of golf courses. But people are playing more golf, the, the foundation figures show, but the number of courses is slowly declining. So there are more people playing golf. That is not true. He says that there are fewer people playing golf. That is the reason for the decline. That is not true. You must, I encourage you to go to the National Golf Foundation website, the NGF dashboard. There Greg Nathan publishes his monthly newsletters. In those, uh, 2000, uh, April 2017, I had this one article uh, in the year 2016, golf participation in the U.S., record of number of beginners, increasing interest, and new measures of engagement. Now, I will follow up with this on a more in-depth uh, letter, but I have more to uh, cover here at this moment. Now, I speculate that this golf course has been mismanaged. I do not have no the numbers to provide the, that. And I cannot call a subpoena to ask for the head pro to come in here 
to give the numbers that 634 rounds of golf were played in the third week of July. That's an outstanding number. That was a huge Saturday. So I followed up. It was a month. Would you like another minute? Yes, please. Yes, sir. That uh, for the entire month, 1,850 rounds of golf were played. Now, I've also made a reference to the owners of the golf course, and I've sent an email to the commission today. Cabot Golf is the same as Cabot Investments LLC, who have been arrested for investment fraud. Now, this is a contingency contract. Is that correct? So Stephen Hoyer is not the owner of this golf course until this land use change is permitted. So I believe that he will not be the owner to have the decision not to run this property as a golf course if you decline this, which you must do. You must decline it. Else in the public care to comment for a close the public hearing? Are you seeing anyone? I'm going to go ahead and close the public portion to be heard. Mr. Mealy. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll try to address the comments kind of in the order they were given because that's the way I wrote them down. So um, there was a number of comments regarding apartments. We're not building apartments. We're only building single family homes and townhomes. The maximum height of our structures will be two stories. These are all for sale, not for rent. Secondly, um, there are recreation areas within our site. Uh, we have offered to make them available to our neighbors as well as our residents. Uh, third, the main entrance is on Military Trail, not Crystal Lake Drive. Crystal Lake Drive is a secondary entrance. That would be for residents only. Residents, guests, and others will come through Military Trail. Um, I checked, uh, uh, Commissioner Battle, your question. Uh, in 2015, one golf course opened in the state of Florida, 17 closed in the state of Florida. Now, the National Golf Foundation doesn't break down the data by county, only by state. Um, one of the uh, uh, speakers referred to the fact that you've had a certain number of golf courses closed and tried to compare it to that 211 that closed nationwide. That 211 that closed nationwide was in one year. We weren't measuring five years. If it was five years, I don't know what the number would have been. Uh, but that was in one year. So the percentage that was mentioned was, was not accurate. And let me clarify what the Gulf National Golf Foundation means when they say public versus private. Their use of the term public doesn't mean necessarily just owned by government. Public golf courses are ones that are open to the public. Either it's owned by a city or a county, or if you want to just show up and make a tee time and pay your fee, you can play for the day. Private golf courses are ones that are for members only. So when I say that five courses went from private to public, I don't mean they were purchased by government. I simply mean they were open for the general public as opposed to only being limited to members. Um, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Morantz mentioned the fifth one that I had forgotten. Um, Mr. Morantz also referred to your economic development report that was adopted recently. And it does say one of the things that you need here to support new business is more housing. Uh, the realtor, I don't know the young lady, although I was happy to hear what she said. It is true that a lot of people only want to buy a newly constructed house. You haven't had a new single family subdivision built in the city, I think, for 25 years. Uh, I believe the most recent one was just uh, north of Hillsborough, right up against the turnpike. And I, I believe I worked on that when I was in my early days of practicing law. Um, Mr. Rickey referred to the viability of nine-hole courses. Well, Mr. Hoyer actually talked with Mr. Miller out of uh, Miami, who runs the nine-hole course there. And Mr. Miller, who Mr. Ricky referred to, told him that the only way that place stays open is because it's owned by the county, and the county subsidizes it with tax money. Otherwise, it would not be viable either. I think it was also mentioned that Boca Raton is selling their current municipal course for development. There are developers who have competed for the purchase up there and they are renovating the one course over on the beach. So it's a trade-off. They're closing one, they're renovating another one. There's two courses up there now. When they're done, there will only be one. So it's not an addition of golf, it's a subtraction of golf. Uh, there was a, a good comment and question about traffic studies. So I would like to, to, to share with you how we do them. When we do a traffic study for a land use amendment, we do the following. All the development that's already in the ground, all that traffic is counted. 
all the development that's under construction, we also count that as if it was already there. All the development that has been approved but not yet constructed is also counted as if it was already there. And then we add ours on top. So I assure you that our traffic analysis is based on the fact that we're the last ones in. Anything in the ground is counted. Anything that's under construction is counted. Anything that's approved is counted. And then we add ours on top. So uh, the cumulative effect of traffic is definitely included in all of these traffic studies that's required by the county regulations for land use amendments. Um, Mr. Cabot, who was referred to earlier, and he has had a checkered pass, has not been involved in this course for seven years. Uh, Mr. Cabot sold to the group of 35 people who are the current owners based in an uh, organization in California, and they've owned the course for seven years. So Mr. Cabot is not involved. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about how desirable it might be to keep the course open. Uh, whether the city approves the land use amendment or not has no bearing on whether something remains a golf course. The land use category could remain as is, but that doesn't mean a golf course would remain open. Uh, there's not a lot of great uses in the commercial recreation category, but there are other ones other than golf courses. Or, as we've seen in many locations, the golf course closes and the property just goes fallow. Uh, recently, the uh, Broken Woods course in uh, Coral Springs was redeveloped. It was closed for 10 years before it happened. When we finally had our hearings, neighbors came out and said, please approve this, because for 10 years they were looking at a closed down golf course that had nothing going on there. So uh, whether you approve the land use amendment or not, whether Mr. Hoyer proceeds with the property or not, the golf course is going to be closed. That's the letter you receive from the current owners. I also want to point out that in addition to the newspaper advertisements for tonight, the city sent out over 1,400 mailed notices to neighbors, over 1,400. So I know we had a healthy crowd tonight, but I would ask you to recognize that with the five community meetings we had, where the numbers were much larger in the beginning and much smaller today, people have recognized that we're delivering on what we said we would do. Now, in terms of the golf numbers, I just want to point out everything I talked to you about is out of these reports. This is the 2017 uh, golf facilities in the U.S. report uh, provided by the National Golf Foundation, and it is called the Definitive Report on the State of Golf Supply in the United States. These are not my numbers. These are the NGF's numbers. And this is an advocacy group for the golf course industry. They're going to try to make the numbers look as good as they can, and even they say that the decline in golf is what I showed you about uh, the number of people, uh, fewer people playing golf, and the golf course is closing. I uh, also just one last thing. Florida has 1,019 golf courses. The next highest of any state in the country is California with 888. Florida has more golf courses than most of the regions in this report. Florida has more golf courses than Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont combined, which have 909. And so that's, and they have more than uh, the combined states of Alabama, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Tennessee that have 889. And so it's not surprising that we're seeing these closures. Many golf courses were built in this state by developers who sold houses around them, sold the golf course to a golf course company for very low dollars, and they still couldn't make it work. So I know it's easy to say if somebody did a better job, it would be profitable. If somebody could do a better job and it would be profitable, somebody would have purchased already with that intent in mind. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Before you sit down, I do have a question concerning the traffic. That seems to be one of the biggest issues that we have here. Can you right. go into more detail? about uh, what's being done to try to mitigate some of that? Well, first of all, uh, when we filed our land use amendment, we did a traffic analysis. We submitted it to the city, and you had your traffic outside traffic engineering consultant review it and make recommendations. So first of all, I mentioned the uh, turn lane that your traffic consultant requested uh, at Green Road, which we ag agreed to do. Your traffic consultant also made comments regarding our entrance with the setback of the gates to make sure that the entrance was wide enough that the gates were far enough off the road so that we wouldn't stack up out in the street. I also mentioned the traffic signal that was requested at the first reading that we've agreed to pay for. Now we're also processing our rezoning and our site plan. And if there are additional comments there, 
whether they be traffic comments, utility comments, whatever they may be, we will address them to your satisfaction. Um, the uh, traffic was definitely studied both here and at the county, and we have done everything that we've been asked to do. And, and in addition to buying an expensive piece of property on Military Trail to provide the proper access to this site from a main road and only the secondary access from Crystal Lake Drive. Okay. On Green Road, one of the things that you said was the turn lane, if a room is available. If right away is available. And if it's not, what happens? Uh, then we'll see if there's another improvement we can make. We've looked at it so far and we believe the right of way is there, but we have to review that with the county because they have jurisdiction at that location to make sure they agree. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I neglected to mention one thing. Um, the last speaker said that the Department of Transportation gave negative comments. That is not correct. They, what they gave us was what they call technical assistance comments, and we've adopted every one of them. And the county took this report from DOT. They asked us to address it. We did, and the county said, you've addressed this to our satisfaction. So they were not take negative comments. They were technical assistance comments that we've complied with. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mealy, one more. I yes. got a couple more. Excuse, I don't see any lights popping up, so I'm going to take the time. Okay. Um, have you, has Mr. Hoyer and the ownership looked at the, the viability of running a nine hole golf course there and doing a limited size uh, development? Yes. And that's why Mr. Ricky had mentioned to Mr. Hoyer that he wanted him to speak to, I, I'm sorry, I forgot Mr. Miller's first name from Miami. Uh, he, Mr. Hoyer called Mr. Miller. He talked to him about the nine hole operation down there. And Mr. Miller told him that it's a nine hole operation. It's subsidized by county tax revenue, and that's how they keep it open. Now, I don't think, at least as Mr. Morant said, other than Tamarack, who purchased the Colony West course, I have found that most governments don't want to take on a losing proposition. Um, all the municipal courses that I'm seeing in Broward County are being heavily financed by the local governments that own them. And you see that in their budgets each year. How long has the current ownership owned this golf course? Seven years. Seven years. And, and I, the reason that I think that it is often misunderstood is because it's my understanding they purchased the asset of the company rather than purchasing the real estate, so the name on the deed would not necessarily have changed. And you renovated that, that they, they renovated the uh, clubhouse. clubhouse, is that uh, correct? They built a new clubhouse, um, and still it's not successful. If you remember the old Crystal Lake Club, Club, Clubhouse, it had a very large banquet facility. Uh, I think it got run down over the years. Uh, they built a smaller clubhouse that was still be able to provide for the golf, but maybe not the, some of the social activities that used to happen at the large facility. Okay. Have you attempted to try, has the ownership attempted to try to sell this golf course to any other uh, golf course ownership that might be willing to come in and take it over? I don't know. Okay. No, no. Excuse me, no one, we can't have any outbursts from the crowd, please. And, and Mayor, I would say, I'm not sure how we would know unless they told us, because if they had private conversations with someone, I don't think anyone would know uh, okay. the answer to that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Battle, and then uh, Commissioner Drowski. Uh, Ms. Amelie. Yes. I want you to speak a moment because several people came up here talking about the quality of life uh, issue, and I need you to address that. I, I did hear you say something, um, and I don't want to uh, put words in your mouth about how we're going to uh, address that in that particular area. Well, first, um, I pointed out how we're going to ring this property with water. And so we find generally in real estate the, the best value for a lot premium is when you're on water. Uh, golf is good too, but not as good as being on water. It's also going to provide a separation from our community and the existing communities for security purposes. The reason I introduced the letters from Pembroke Pines is because whenever we come in with something new, people are worried about the worst that can happen. And that's the same thing that happened when we first went there. Everyone was worried about the worst that could happen. And they've now built the development, it's almost finished, and you saw the results. 
the adjacent homeowners association board member, the adjacent homeowners association members on the planning and zoning board from, since 2001, a very knowledgeable person about planning, the mayor, um, told you what a job they did to satisfy each and every concern. I remember at the last hearing in Pembroke Pines, a lady got up from one of the surrounding neighborhoods and said that when we were doing some of our work on the property, she found a, a brown stain on her driveway. She called Mr. Hoyer and he had a pressure cleaner come over the next day and clean it off. I mean, just stories like that. So not only are we trying to plan the development to make sure we're protecting the quality of life of our neighbors, but while we're building it, we'll do the same. There was a comment about arsenic. If you don't redevelop a golf course, you don't have to clean it up. You can leave the contamination in the ground. We will be cleaning it up. And the method by which it's cleaned up, and our environmental consultant is here, he's the premier consultant on this activity in this area, has told me that the way we do it, that contamination never goes into the air. It's not going to be in someone, someone breathing it. It's handled according to permits from the county and the state so that it's done properly. Okay, talk to me a bit about your parks, uh, whatever you're going to have out there, your Could, biking trails and... So uh, we are, uh, all of this property uh, will have, will be uh, accessible, bicycle, pedestrian, and vehicular. And we will connect to the local road system uh, and provide any connection that would help people not only drive a car, but to be able to walk and bike. One of the things we love about the property is that the city has a 50-acre park just north of us, and we're very excited about being able for our residents to go to that park. Uh, we'll be paying substantial park impact fees to the city that can be used to help you develop that park. So uh, everything we're doing is in conjunction with vehicular access, bicycle access, and pedestrian access. Thank you. Commissioner Drosky. I had my question answered by SAP, actually. Okay. You want to share? <laughs> uh, I asked if the applicant agreed to comply with all of staff comments, which is something I typically did at planning and zoning, and they have. Yes, we have. And if there is any motion, if, if you choose to make a motion to approve the item, I would ask that you incorporate it in the understanding and uh, the basis a uh, partial basis being the uh, voluntary commitments made by Mr. Mealy uh, during his presentation on the record. And, and we will reiterate that we will comply with those. Thank you. And general information of the uh, of, uh, extraordinary majority is required for this type of uh, matter. Extraordinary majority? Yeah. Okay. Okay. More okay. That's probably a little more clear. Anyone else from the commission want to comment? I'd like to make a motion to approve. But, but before you do that, if I may, I, um, I, I've got a couple comments on this because, like, no, no one's. I've grown up in South Florida my entire life, born and raised here. I grew up across the street from a golf course. That's the landscape of my youth here in Deerfield Beach, South Florida, this area. All right, that, that's what you see. That's what you're accustomed to. Uh, that has changed. Um, I, I fought against the Deerfield Beach Country Club conversion because I did want to keep that open, and, and I, I didn't like to see the change. I do serve on the Broward County Planning Council, and I've seen several of these come before us. And you realize that, that the battle to try to keep them just doesn't work anymore. Um, we don't have their books. We can't tell you whether or not it's viable or not, but I would imagine it makes more sense rather than getting a one-time hit of money if you could have a perpetual cash cow, you'd want to keep that. And what you don't see is a lot of people coming forward. Tama Shanter has been closed for over a dozen years. So when I hear the statistics that we've had four closed in five years, I, I'm not sure where that comes from. Yes, we've lost uh, um, the Deerfield Beach Country Club. We did lose um, Century Village and potentially this one as well. That would be three. But Tama Shanter has been closed for at least 10 years, 12 years maybe. And with that space that was there, no one came forward to buy that property. And you would think that with all these golf courses closing in this area, you would have people flocking in to go to the last remaining golf courses that you have. And, and the numbers don't appear to be there to support that. So what does that option leave the city of Deerfield Beach? Well, we can 
not grant this and the developer can and they've gone through this long process they're going to they say they're not going to run a golf course there they can leave it abandoned much like you have over at the Tamar Shanter property um, and that becomes a huge loss for them obviously and uh, even more than probably what they have now and they could put in some they have limp they have not a lot of options but they could put in some things that you really don't want over there when it comes to the, the way the zoning category is. And we don't have the ability to stop that because they have that within their property rights. The other option the city of Deerfield Beach has is to take it over as a municipal golf course. Colony West and Tamarack that was brought up was purchased by Tamarack for $4 million with another $7.4 million put in for uh, enhancements to it. All right. That's a huge sum of money. Now, that's part of their economic development plan. The reason why is they're planning on putting a giant hotel and others to try to build on top of that. So they're not necessarily looking to make money on that. It's part of a <coughs> thing to keep that there in order to get a hotel in Tamarack. They clearly have the space and they have the ability to put a hotel in there. So that's part of their plan. Boca with the Ocean Breeze, $24 million to purchase with another 10 to $12 million to renovate. That's not what the city of Deerfield Beach should be doing or is prepared to do. Sunrise Runs is a municipal golf course. They do it because they, they, they do it for their residents there. $800,000 loss per year. Boca, Reef, Boca Red Reef was $234,004 loss. Pompano Beach, $593,000 loss. City of uh, Hollywood, with their golf course that they have, and this was brought up at the Bar County Planning Council by the elected official from Hollywood, as they take a half million dollars loss per year. Davy occasionally turns a profit. Their biggest profit they turned was in 2017, and that was a whopping $13,000. Uh, they've lost as much as $29,000 per year in 2015. The city of Deerfield Beach to get involved in the municipal golf course is just simply not viable. One, you have to buy the property and then two you have to maintain it and clearly looking at what other cities are doing they're taking losses and some of them are okay with that not, not everything we do in this city is meant to make a profit but looking at those numbers that's staggering and it's something we simply can't afford so that doesn't leave with with a lot of options um, I would love to see a nine-hole golf course stay there and be viable and have new development put in there because we do need new development this it was said that this is going to be the first new residential development for single-family homes in 25 years in the city of Deerfield Beach I've got a feeling this is going to be the last think of another parcel of land of this size that could be redeveloped for single-family homeowner usage I don't see it so we can wait another 25 years people complain and say well our, our taxes are too high here in this city well, one of the ways to do that, and one of the things that's been clearly pointed out by studies that have been done, is the city lacks new residential homes. That's what people are looking for. We have the ability to bring in new businesses, but we don't have the ability to get the people that work there, at least on the higher level, the, the ability to, to stay here in Deerfield Beach. In other words, capturing their dollars here on a day-to-day -day basis when they're not at work and when they're going to work. So that's one of the challenges we have. It's not fun and it's not easy to do that, but I look at these numbers and I don't see what the other options that we have. Commissioner Drosky. Uh, thank you. I, I empathize with the residents that are out there. I mean, this is a quality of life issue. When the green space is gone, it's gone, it's gone forever. You're not going to unpave what we're, what we're anticipating doing here. Um, and I was a member of Deerfield Beach Country Club, so I know what it's like to lose uh, a golfing opportunity, although I think the game of golf is better for it. Um, but the, the empirical data, we've heard competing um, information about you know, uh, golfing, and I've done my own independent research, and from what I've found, the empirical data is clear that golfing is on the decline, not in the incline in the state of Florida. And so the question that I asked Mr. Mealy, I did so for a reason at the beginning of the hearing. Does his client intend to operate this as a golf course if this is not improved? And the answer was a clear-cut no. So that begs the question, how, how are golf courses saved in the state of Florida? And the simple answer is they are not, um, for the most part. When, when they are saved, there's a backup plan. There's a plan B 
uh, that goes in place. And the mayor brought up the Boca National Golf Club, uh, which is the defunct Ocean Breeze Golf Club in Boca Raton. Boca's Parks District is putting $24 million to saving that particular golf course. Deerfield Beach doesn't have that kind of money to save Crystal Lake. We just don't. And we don't have the ability to do a bond uh, to save it either. And oh, by the way, Boca Raton's municipal golf course out west is being offered for $73 million. So Boca Raton has the money to do this. The city of Deerfield Beach doesn't. And what I haven't heard tonight is a plan B. Um, if we don't act, if we don't approve this tonight, what is the backup plan? What is the savior? There are no developers coming in saying they want to save this and continue it as a golf course. I haven't heard that tonight. Um, we can look at our sister city, Boca Raton, again for another example. Uh, the Camino Del Mar golf course, which is not in the city limits, it's actually county. The county refused to allow developers to develop that into single family homes. And now what is that golf course? It's nothing. It's, uh, it's shrub and brush uh, and it's an eyesore to the community. And that's what I don't want to see happen here in the city of Deerfield Beach is an eyesore in our community. It is a quality of life issue, but think this all the way through. What is the quality of life that we're doing? We have to see the forest through the trees. It, it's not an easy decision, but I mean, I think we all see the, what will happen here if we do not approve this is that we don't want an eyesore in the Deerfield Beach for a golf course that we have been told point blank will not be run as a golf course in the future. Vice Mayor Miller, then Commissioner Battle. Yes, um, before we get to the motion, I used to live off Military Trail. So I, I lived 10 years in Waterford. Uh, when I moved to Waterford, on the west side of 28th Avenue, there were cows. I mean, things change. We're like, Florida's like a peninsula that's filling up. Just like I come from Long Island, it filled up right out the island through Suffolk County. Uh, that's a reality. People desire to be here, and it is filling up. Uh, our economic development study recommended that we need more housing. One of the managers of the, one of the premier real estate companies said, we have demand for new housing. So the economic development study said we knew housing. The, the one, premier real estate companies in the city said we have a demand for new housing. That's economic saying pointing to this should be done. The economics of the nine hole or golf course or this 18 hole golf course is saying it's not survivable. So the economics is, is, is dictating what can be done. Then you have an opportunity with a developer with a reputation like this man has who we have letters from the mayor and the associations adjacent to the golf course he's developing in Brimbrook. Brian said there couldn't be a better developer. Now, what would happen if we chose not to do this tonight? It will go turn into uh, Jurassic Park. Uh, 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 we got iguanas and rats and uh, chameleons and we got raccoons. And you know what? And then X amount of years later, Somebody's going to say, this has really gone downhill, and a developer come in, and probably not of the quality of this man sitting in this room right now that's willing to invest in our city. Uh, traffic is a problem. Traffic's a problem everywhere. I live on A1A. It's night and day. Six months, I can't even get out of, onto A1A. Six months, I could walk across there without looking both ways. It thinks, that's a reality. There's pros and cons to whatever we do. But we have an opportunity right now to take a place that's not viable economically, that more than one, a study as well as a real estate uh, professional has told us there's a demand in our area for this. And talk about the young people. Yeah, we're the Kiwanis, uh, Rotary. They're all concerned about young people. Here we have the young people moving into the apartments on Crystal Lake Drive with nowhere to play. This developer says, I've got three point something acres of parks they can use, and the money that this community will help develop in a tax base, will help us develop the nine acres of, of uh, the golf course that closed down. What's it called? Um, just, just north of it, the um, Temeshana. We've got ten, nine holes, 51 acres, sitting there ready to be developed, and the city does not have the money. Well, you know what? This community will help us afford to develop a, a tremendous park. For the entire community, this community will revitalize the whole western section of Fort Lauderdale. It's sort of been stagnant for many years. And it's allowed, like uh, Katie said, the, the, the 
homes along uh, right east of this community kind of get run down to actually be reduced reduce in value this will stimulate owners will take a response because everybody's value is going to go up with this community and if you really don't like it you'll get more money for your house and you can move somewhere else um, but I'm telling you, this is going to be an economic stimulus. And sure, there will be more traffic. That's a, there's a pros and cons no matter whatever you have. But a golf course that's going to close, turn into Jurassic Park, and then someday some developer's going to come along because we're like up to here with this, not of this quality. So I'm going to oh, let Ms. Battle speak, but I want to make a motion to approve. You have a motion on the floor, Ms. Battle? Yeah. Commissioner Battle? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Commissioner, I mean, Vice Mayor Miller, please don't send the uh, iguanas my way. I, I have <laughs> enough of those. Okay. But uh, just for the sake of the citizens, you know, we've heard a lot about quality of life tonight, and certainly I am about quality of life. But when I chat with my park director and found out that we have 50 parks in this city, encompassing more than 220 acres, those are, that, that's what we have right now. I believe sincerely that we are providing for the quality or trying to help to provide for the quality of life for all our citizens here in Deerfield Beach. And just like uh, Vice Mayor Miller said, we have 50 acres just waiting in that area that we don't even have money to develop. And uh, Mr. Hoyer has promised us, you know, uh, that, and, and I'm holding him to his word, uh, if this thing passes tonight, then we will be able to develop that. And not only that, I like the fact that you have said, and I'm going to hold you to that if this thing passes, that those people in that area, the parks that you're going to have there, the riding trails, the, back, the bike trails and stuff like that, will all be open to the citizens in that particular area. And that helps me then to, um, you know, close my uh, decision about the quality of life issues. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor and call for it. Uh, oh, sorry. oh, yeah, with the stipulation that with the, the uh, things Mr. Area. Mealy has agreed to will be included in the motion. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Miller, would you also consider that we make sure that the language is tightened up in there, that if the uh, turn lane is not available on Green Road, that there absolutely will be concessions made to make sure that there is some sort of lane to help mitigate that traffic and not just with the plan of, well, there isn't right of way available, so we can, won't do it. I, if if we can, our attorney can help us make that concise, I would like to add that to the motion. If that uh, right of way is not available for that turn lane, we'll work with your traffic folks to come up with another improvement. I'm, gonna hold up on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. No, that's not the traffic light, Mr. Murphy. This, is, this a, is a turn lane. Oh, a turn lane. So that, no, no. It's a that, different that, location. That's in the fire safety agreement. Okay. Right. So we have an amended motion. We have a second. We have a motion and a second. We have a roll call, please. Commissioner Battle? Yes. Commissioner Droski? Yes. Commissioner Parnes? No. Vice Mayor Miller? Yes. Mayor Gantz? Yes. Thank you. Next item. Uh, consent agenda is the uh, next item. Is there any polls? Give a few minutes for the people to clear out. Commissioner Drosky? 7, 10, 11, 17. <clears throat> I'm sorry, not, just 7, 10, and 17. I'm sorry, not, not 11. 7, 10, and 17. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, anyone else have any other polls? Any other polls? Okay. Public to be heard on our consent agenda items. Anyone have any comments you'd like to make on the consent agenda? Was Not seeing anyone coming forward. I'd like to was close the. Was any polls? Yes, sir. There are polls. Seven, ten, and seventeen. Seven, ten, and seventeen. Not seeing anyone coming up from the public. I'm going to close the public portion to be heard. Item or 15, if I may. 
Yes, you, usually when the public hearing is started, you come up, and that's how we get the ball rolling. Thank you. So. Thank you, sir. Uh, item 15, uh, just my concern. Uh, FDOT and uh, others have made a decision on some of these roadways to have shared lanes with bicycles and cars in the same lane. And this concerns me greatly. I think uh, coming in on uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard and that change, that's part of the, the, the bicycle lane situation there is with shared roadway. And I think this is, for Florida, this is, a, this is a dangerous situation to start proposing. We have more accidents with bicycles in danger on bicycles and road when cars come together. Because right now we have a three-yard uh, three separation between cars and, and bicycles for a reason. And so I'd suggest before we go ahead with any kind of change with FTOT on that roadway, we look and see how other, other municipalities do with it. Because while they say this is great in Europe and it works in other places, I don't think it's working in our city. I think this is a very dangerous thing, and, and I'd hate to see putting cars and bicycles in the same lane, especially unless, and not if that would qualify either, but I would never have a right turn on red in any of these intersections that have those kind of roadways going on because you can't even pay attention to what's there now, let alone turn right on red without stopping. That's where most of these accidents are occurring. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public on any of the other items? we we'll close the public portion to be heard. I make a motion to approve with the uh, three polls. I forget the numbers. Well, yeah, they're being exempt. Yeah. Oh, exempt. Make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. We have a roll call, please. Commissioner Battle. Yes. Commissioner Droski. Yes. Commissioner Parnett. Yes. Vice Mayor <coughs> Yes. Mayor Gantz. Yes. Commissioner Droski, your polls. Uh, very briefly, on number seven, we're being asked to vote for Robert Week or Weech. I don't know him. Before I vote for somebody, I just want to make sure that we're all okay with this individual. And that's going to be my same comment for number 10 as an FYI. Oh, he was elected. He was, uh, he, oh, he's the fifth member? Okay. So, he's an so rather than everybody just speaking at once, the city manager did have his light on. Can we just go with the city manager at this point? Thank you. Thank you. So the way the board is made up, not to interrupt you, Andy, but... I had my light on before you did. I was quick, like <laughs> Jeopardy. Um, Mr. Weech is actually appointed by the four standing members. Two of those members are voted on by the members of the pension board. The other two are appointed <coughs> by the city commission. Those four determine who the fifth one is, so you really have no authority to not put him on there. Is that correct, Andy? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Motion to approve. <laughs> <laughs> second. We have a motion to second for item number seven. We have a roll call, please. Commissioner Battle. Yes. Commissioner Droski. Yes. Commissioner Pardes. Yes. Vice Mayor Miller. Yes. Mayor Gantz. Yes. Same thing for 10? No, I believe this one's different. I so. know 10. All right. Um, Mr. Uh, city Manager, you want to comment on this or City Attorney? Uh, uh, this, this, is, this is not. This is, uh, the commission's appointment. My appointment. I know Mr. Stevens. He's been on already. He's just re renewing his uh, next oh. term. Okay. So uh, he's been serving. So I make a motion to approve, Mr. Stevens. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments? The roll call, please. Commissioner Battle. Yes. Commissioner Droski. Yes. Commissioner Parnes. Yes. Vice Mayor Miller. Yes. Mayor Gantz. Yes. With respect to 17, I guess this is for the city attorney. Is there a mechanism to enforce what we're doing in here? Is this subject to the other uh, enforcement mechanisms for parking in our in our city code? Yeah, I just want that. Uh, these hour parking are, are extremely difficult. Yeah, uh, it's, it's much hopefully uh, by getting a voluntary enforcement. I don't know how BSO. I don't know how how we do those when we have like a two or four hour parking at them. We have an actual mechanism. City manager. Yeah, thanks. I apologize. I'm just trying to play by the rules here. So, um, with the lights. But yes, um, BSO does have a mechanism. It's not very effective, though. It's something that we also do in the cove, where we do not necessarily have the pay by plate like we do at the beach. So they basically will chalk a tire 
and it's more on the honor system than anything else because someone can go out there and easily wash off the chalk mark, which happens in the cove. Thank you. Thank you for telling that secret, city yeah. manager. I'm sure <laughs> all violators will be very yeah. thrilled to hear yes. that. I, yeah, unfortunately, it's not that much of a secret because it's I'll been brought up numerous times during the Cove parking lot. C Commissioner Drosky. Just one quick uh, uh, follow-up question then. Are we doing uh, additional or improved signage to reflect what we would be enacting tonight? City manager. Yeah. Yes, we, we would put in new signage. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, we have a motion to second. Uh, roll call. Commissioner Battle? Yes. Commissioner Drosky? Yes. Commissioner Parnes? Yes. Vice Mayor Miller? Yes. Mayor Gantz? Yes. Thank you for the support on that. The, the reason for this was a request from one of the businesses over there. And, and if you spend the time to talk to them, this is, uh, uh, you'll find out that the, the traffic, that the parking issues that they have over there. Um, are, are really much worse than what people realize. There are, just for consistency's sake, if you go across the street, there is a four hour parking term, uh, park, parking limit as well as a sign. So we just want at least consistency there on that. And I know that'll be a big relief for them. It'll give them, I'm sure they'll be monitoring that, even videotaping if they have to, should it exceed the four hours. Um, okay, next items. Uh, I think we're all in general. Uh, yeah, yes. fine. General. A resolution of the City Commission approving uh, providing for ratification of the collective bargaining agreement between the City of Deerfield Beach and Local 1010 District Council 78 of the International Union of Painters, Painters and Allied Trade, AFL-CIO, in effect from October 1, 2017 through September 30, 2020, authorizing the manager to sign the collective bargaining agreement. For the audience, can we go into detail about this particular item? City manager, go ahead. Okay. Well, I'd like to uh, bring up Miss Robin, our chief human resources officer, since she did, did such a wonderful job with this because this was ratified unanimously by the union, which is a pretty hard uh, task. So I'll let her take the yeah, credit a, for it. This was yeah. a much to my sure. We were very upset about this on my side of the deal because it was negotiated entirely without the assistance of counsel. <laughs> and, and for but for the record, legal did review it before it went to the commission. Don't worry. <laughs> we have a legal counsel do the negotiation, and uh, this time we're still done in I I understand your argument now, Mr. Morota. Yeah. <laughs> Can you get the share in the fund? Is really what he's upset about. Exactly. I saved on the budget, though. Ms. Robin. <laughs> Good evening. Um, Included in your packet, so what I figured I'd do is go through the significant changes. I don't think the public or you want to get into the minutia of some of the language changes that we made just to clean things up from old contracts. So if that's okay, I'll just go through the, the significant changes or things that I think would be of interest. Um, the, the first thing, as far as the highlights are, is wages. That always is the, the biggest that everybody wants to know about. So effective technically October 1st, even though today is October 3rd, it's retroactive to the 1st, that all bargaining unit employees would receive a 2.5% COLA, cost of living adjustment, to their base hourly rates. This would also increase the pay plans minimum and maximums to correlate with the cost of living increases. Uh, we did include a reopener in the contract for both final years of the contract, depending on where we're at with the budget fiscally, so that we don't we're not wrapped to that cola being consistent going forward. So we do have that reopener. We also added some different language in things that were past practices that were currently being done through the city. Some that that honestly probably even predate Andy Marotis. Um, so we we wanted to get, to get them memorialized in the contract so that if I'm not here the the one person in sustainable management that understands it, it, it that it's in the contract and memorialized so there's no confusion so these were not changes that were made as part of the contract they were just added and that was included with the driver safety incentive pay bonus program that's what provides $50 a month to employees that don't have a workers compensation claim at fault accident they're using their PPE equipment properly, and they also uh, do not have any discipline 
and, and that's how they earn that. We also added language for task force pay that's only used by sustainable management employees that work the holidays so that the trash is still picked up on every day. I think they only get Christmas Day off. So that was added, something that has been in effect for years. We also added in there was no language in the drug-free workplace program about random drug screening. We added language with how we are currently providing the random screenings, but the union and us felt it was important that it be uh, memorialized in the contract. Certification pay, we did negotiate an increase from $400 to $500. I'll remind you that that is a one-time payment for their duration of employment. So the, the cost impact per employee that would earn that is only $100. That starts effective upon ratification, so it doesn't go backwards for any employee that has already earned it. Um, and we also at change the language to make it so that it is preferred as opposed to required. The language actually said required or preferred, and we negotiated that if it's required, we shouldn't be making payment on something that we're hiring somebody that they should have. Uh, standby pay was another item that was not included in the contract, but was a past practice that we added so that it was consistent and fair. We also included the, the classifications that they are eligible for that. So that is not an across the board that every employee would be eligible for standby pay for being on call. And then the biggie that I think everybody worries about next to wages is the health insurance. We did not negotiate changes for health insurance rates for this year. We did include a reopener for the second two years of the contract. We did change dental. We did eliminate one of the plans, uh, the Humana uh, plan, actually at the request of the union, and we changed the tiers so that they match the current health insurance. So some employees may see a dollar or two uptick. Some actually might see a dollar or two decrease in their rates, but it was not significant. And then we also added um, vision insurance has been in effect for a few years, and for whatever reason, it was no charge to the employees for vision. We have changed that. There is a, a, a $1 payment by the employee, and then it increases based on dependence. And those are your significant changes throughout the contract. Thank Any you. questions? Any questions from the commission? Yeah. Open us up for the public to be heard. Anyone from the public? Not seeing anyone, I would close the public hearing. Make a motion to approve. Second. Commissioner Drosky, you have a question? I, I don't have a question. I have a, a, a statement. And anyone who wants to challenge the commission going forward uh, on this, because I, I anticipate, oh, here goes the commission, you know, um, granting the unions again. I, I strongly caution you to know your facts if you're going to dive into this particular category, because the union did make um, significant uh, concessions to the city. Uh, the two and a half percent uh, was not the number that they originally asked for. It was significantly less. Uh, and in addition, the city, uh, as Mrs. Robin indicated in her presentation, uh, cleaned up some language that hadn't been formally in the contract before, which is now there. So please uh, go through the particular uh, areas that were enunciated and and do your homework when if you're going to to come out on this particular subject because the city did get a lot if not more than we anticipated in return for this particular contract we are a long way from the days of five percent uh, merit and four percent cola and the merit was not incentive based it was whether you showed up or not you got it so uh, we're a long ways from that we have a motion on the floor we have a second second we have a motion and a second. A roll call, please. Commissioner Battle? Yes. Commissioner Drosky? Yes. Commissioner Parnes? Yes. Vice Mayor Miller? Yes. Mayor Gantz? Yes. Next is the resolution of the City Commission of the City of Deerfield Beach appointing Beth Willett to the Deerfield Beach Education Advisory Board. Any comments from the Commission before I open it up to the public? Not seeing any, I'd like to open this up to the public. Any from the public care to comment? Katie Fry, Tog, 418 Southeast 2nd Street. Deerfield Beach. Deerfield Beach, Florida, 33441. I don't know if there is a better person to serve on this board than Bette Willett. She is amazing when it comes to education on so many different levels. She is top notch in so many different organizations that she's involved in, and I think she'll be a great asset. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Not seeing anyone, I'm going to close the public portion to be heard. 
Uh, Mr. Parnas, Commissioner I'll make a Parnas. Motion to approve that wallet. We have a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Okay, roll call, please. Commissioner Battle. Yes. Commissioner Drosky. Yes. Commissioner Parnes. Yes. Vice Mayor Miller. Yes. Mayor Gantz. Yes. Uh, the next is a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Deerfield Beach appointing Arlene Johnson to the Cultural Committee. Any commission comments before I open it up to the public? Open it up to the public, even from the public. Not saying you want to close it. Commissioner Parnes? I recommend that Arlene Johnson. I've known her for many years and she will be an asset to the city. So I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. We have a roll call, please. Commissioner Battle? Yes. Commissioner Drosky? Yes. Commissioner Parnes? Yes. Vice Mayor Miller? Yes. Mayor Gantz? Yes. Next is the resolution of the City Commission of the City of Deerfield Beach recognizing Marcus Howe as City of Deerfield Beach Jazz Ambassador. Commissioner Bell, you want to introduce before we open it up to the public? Yes, I recommend that we approve this. Uh, Miss, Mr. Howell, uh, in case nobody, do, uh, in case someone does not know, Marcus Howell is homegrown, out of District 2. Just received his uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan in jazz studies. Is now um, pursuing a master's degree, and he hopes to teach jazz one day. He has uh, played with some of the best, uh, including um, uh, Winter Marsalis and some of the uh, others. Uh, he is a joy and a delight. A very good kid. Uh, like I said, homegrown, District Two, and I really support this and I'm quite sure that uh, Mr. Howell would uh, be pleased to accept <coughs> this resolution. Thank you. Motion to approve. Yes, he has prayed. Second. Well, uh, open it up to the public. Anyone from the public here to speak? Sure. Not seeing anyone. I'm going to close the public portion to be heard. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Commissioner Drosky, you have a comment? Uh, I believe Mr. Howell is a Spartan, not a Wolverine, so he would probably oh be offended God. by that comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it Michigan State? Oh, my God. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. He'll be outside shortly. <laughs> <laughs> all I know, he's District 2, homegrown. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Yes. We have a roll call, please. I'm oh, sorry? I'll second it. Okay. okay. We have a roll call, please. Commissioner Battle? Yes. Commissioner Drosky? Yes. Commissioner Parnes? Yes. Vice Mayor Miller? Yes. Mayor Gantz? Yes. Uh, item 21? Item 21 or 22 yeah, we're on. Uh, 22. Okay. Okay. Uh, item? Let's see. Oh, okay. No problem. So uh, item number 22 is discussion regarding the volunteer background screening. Um, you know, we did a really good job years ago of trying to push forward and, and, and make the city of Deerfield Beach have this the, the most stringent volunteer background screening at the time. And we did, and, and that held up. And ironically, when we, there were others that came forward that tried to, in my opinion, water it down by putting in an appeals process, even though we had very clear cut rules as far as what was allowed, what wasn't allowed, what fell off your record to allow you to volunteer after a certain amount of time. Um, there were others that felt that we needed to do a, um, an appeals process so you, if you had extenuating circumstances, you could appeal. Um, while that was approved, uh, much to my dismay, while I disagree with it, um, this, that portion of our background check will give us the, an opportunity here that I think will strengthen overall our, our volunteer background screening. Um, and, and many of you might remember when we tried to get to a level two background screen, we had a lot of people that were upset about it. First part of it was because of cost. They didn't like to pay for it. The city's taking care of that. The city will pay for the background checks, level two background checks. But we had other groups that just simply didn't want to participate in it, didn't think it was right, didn't think it was fair. And we had a lot of pushback on that. And ironically, when, dating back to the time when we were talking about putting in an appeals process, the city of Pembroke Pines one commissioner brought forward uh, someone from the city of Pembroke Pines from their Parks and Rec Department who said that um, you needed to put in uh, an appeals process. And at the time, they didn't even have a level two background check in the city of Pembroke Pines. Well, last year, the city of Pembroke Pines uh, upped their game. And not only do they have a level two background check, they do have an appeals process. But they also allow for people to be flagged that while they might not have a conviction if they have any arrests. 
um, that we that they have the ability to reject, not necessarily reject, but at least review people who come forward who do not have a conviction. That's the one loophole that I see for for uh, for our background check screening, and this is because of recent events. And, and And I'll be the first to say when I was interviewed by Bob Norman, and he said. Uh, I, so I challenged him to find me a city that had a better background uh, process than we did. And at the time, there wasn't anybody when we passed it. Well, Pembroke Pines has surpassed that now. You look at our neighbors to the south, they don't even have level two background checks. So while ours are strong, I think it can be stronger. So what I would like to see us do is that if anybody comes forward, regardless of whether they have a conviction or not, if they have uh, certain types of convictions that or excuse me, certain types of arrest, a certain amount within a certain time frame, that that gets reviewed by the appeals process board that we have in place. Um, and at least it gives us an extra layer of defense so they can review something. We close that loophole and at least we know we have eyes being put on what their cases are. Now, now whether Mr. Norman will admit this or not, but I can tell you what he certainly told me, trying to research closed cases or cases that their charges were dropped is not easy. Uh, it's very difficult, but at least it would require that we could figure out a way to require the people that are coming forward that do have these arrests to prove what the circumstances were and leave it up to the board to decide whether or not they should be allowed to be used as a volunteer coach in the city of Deerfield Beach. So that's what my proposal is. And I'd love to hear what you and the public have to say. If you'd like, well, we could just, if, the idea would, if you want to give us direction, we can then prepare the ordinance. Okay. okay. Commissioner Bow. My only concern, and I agree with you, we do need to put in uh, more stringent measures one way or the other because we've had uh, some people slip through the cracks. Uh, my only uh, concern at this particular time, Ms. Mayor, is who sits on that appeal um, board or uh, who's going to be making that decision one way or the other. I think it should be as impartial as possible one way or the other. Uh, you're before the city manager comments, I will tell you that was my concern when that board was first created and I did not want it to become political. I also didn't want it to be cronyism and I was concerned about the makeup of the board. I will say I've been pleasantly surprised that the board has, has done a good job and, and if the city manager can go into specifics on how the board is made up. Yes, uh, Andy, you're going to need to probably help me here with my memory, but I choose the board, and it's a person that's been in law, one person that's either retired law enforcement or a prosecutor. It's uh, usually uh, someone from Parks and Recreation. I believe Ryan Reckley is my designee. Right. And not then for because it could be me, but I usually have Ryan Reckley because he is athletic superintendent. And then one person just from the community. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. That's fine. I, I just need to know who we were asking we, this. We can get them. And I've had, I, at times sat with them, and they're 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 very fair and and, and really, they really go on the board to be fair to the uh, individuals who want to be on the board. Uh, Commissioner Drosky. I just wanted to add that I think it's a good idea, and I would support the city manager um, putting an ordinance together and we can vet then what comes before us. But as far as discussion purposes, I think it should proceed. Okay. Thank you. So do we need it? We don't need to make a no, motion. We, we take just that know. direction. Excellent. Thank you. And for the record, for those of you who seem to forget with that series that they did on channel 10, that was a three part series, not a two part series. People like to cut it off halfway through the whole show, but it is an eye-opening thing, and it's something that, you know, hopefully we can turn a positive into what was a negative situation. Okay. Uh, I think the next item is the bid protest. Yes. Okay. Uh, you have before you a bid protest uh, by Keith and Associates uh, dealing with a, uh, a request for qualifications submitted. Um, and... Uh, the, the, the specific issue is set forth in your backup, but uh, just to set the context so that you can begin your discussion, it, it deals with whether the failure to commit, uh, submit uh, finance, certain financial statements constitute uh, a material variance from the request for uh, qualifications requirement. If, uh, if an omission 
is dematerial, uh, then that calls for disqualification of the bidder. If it's uh, considered a minor irregularity, then, uh, those can be waived and it would not uh, affect the uh, uh, proposer's ability to be selected. Uh, your, our purchasing staff reviewed uh, the, the response of Keith and Associates in, in this particular case and they did not submit their financials. They indicated they would be happy to do so if chosen, uh, but their interpretation of the requirement was that they did not have to do that. Uh, they're, they're very experienced at doing this, so they, they made that interpretation. It's an interpretation our staff agreed with. We agree with our staff position in this regard. Uh, so uh, under our uh, purchasing code, uh, someone in the position of Keith and Associates who has received an interpretation with which they disagree had the option of filing a bid protest. It's, it's a perfectly legitimate type of thing. It's not terribly adversarial. It's that they want to state their position and they believe that they comply in good faith with the requirements. Um, as I indicated, uh, your, the staff felt that uh, disqualification was called for because the omission was material, a material irregularity. We reviewed their finding and agreed with it as your counsel. Uh, they are appealing with it, appealing uh, the decision. Uh, on a bid protest, the commission has three options. Uh, w first is to deny the bid protest, at which time they would continue to be disqualified. They would have their own remedy should they choose to pursue it. The second is to uh, approve, uh, in essence, find merit in the bid protest and fashion relief they deem appropriate. So you could approve it and say, we approve it provided you do such and such a thing. In this case, most likely, if you said approve it, it would be uh, provided you might uh, uh, you provide your financial information or something like that. Um, or else you could just approve it with no condition. Uh, so that's the approval option. And the third option is uh, to uh, throw out all bids and start all over again. So you have those three options. Um, the, you, you are not required to have a presentation, but let me ask, is, uh, I, I see Dodie here. Is there anyone here from any other company that submitted uh, responses to the rest of qualification? Uh, uh, so do you wish to be heard? You do not. Uh, so the commission has the option of, is there, oh, did I miss someone? And, and was this a similar? did not wish to be heard. Okay, uh, I just just want to say, so there are two, two gentlemen uh, from, apparently, since they're not sitting with each other, uh, uh, are from different companies, or either that they don't get along with They might just might be surrounding us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, they want to, they want to overhear different conversations. Uh, Another gentleman right here. And we have three, and do you wish to be heard, sir? I know. Okay. Uh, have I missed anyone else? They seem to be popping up from all over here. Okay. Uh, and, and uh, you do not have to hear presentations, but if you choose to hear, uh, Dodie has uh, uh, come here, and you may hear a presentation from her. And we'll be happy to answer any questions after our presentation. Commissioner Parnas? Yeah. In my former life, I was a bid broker in New York, and I bid on very expensive contracts. If the wording said that I had to submit X, and I didn't do it and my bid was thrown out, that was the end of it. The city felt if I wasn't bright enough to follow the instructions, I shouldn't be entitled to the bid. So if the city asks for financial disclosure for three years and I ignore it, I don't see why anybody should be able to appeal. Well, they, they have a right under the purchase they go, we provide that, it's a way of allowing uh, where, there's, where, there's, where there's some uh, interpretation uh, uh, issues uh, for the commission to, to take a fresh look at the matter and, and uh, make, a, you know, make a determination that uh, irregularity was not as material as staff believes it to be. So it's, 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 it's common and it's a, it's a good method to try to resolve things before uh, things get to a litigation stage and things of that sort. So, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. and, and the commission in this case, does have the discretion uh, to choose any one of the three alternatives. And I think we could provide legal defense to you choosing any one of the three. Commissioner Bell. Unlike Commissioner Parnas, I never bid on anything in my life. However, 
I do come from the world of grants and, and, and whatever, the, oh, the grants and what, requests for proposals. And I'm used to having a, cure, a curing period uh, just in case somebody missed something or whatever, we always uh, give them a chance to cure the project before we go on. Uh, having looked at all, all of the evidence one way or the other, I, I just wonder if we could do such a thing. And I think Andy has given us that uh, uh, out when he said that uh, we can uh, do what, the second thing, Andy? And uh, the, second, the second alternative is to approve uh, uh, with any re to fashion your own remedy, saying we are approving it, provided you do this, or you can just approve it. Uh, we would recommend that there that if you do approve it, that you require some sort of submission of the financials to put everyone on equal footing. Uh, okay. That's if you, that's your choice to, to do that. Now, well, that would be my choice yeah. to do that. Uh, it would save us a lot of headache, I believe, and uh, uh, give a, uh, a worthy, um, I think they're all worthy since they bid it. Lots of times we don't even have people bidding on our projects, so I think they're all worthy. Well, uh, but it gives the uh, person that's doing uh, the, this stuff a chance to cure whatever was wrong with, and then we go forward. And this is not, this is not an award to the firm. Right. It just allows them to be in the run. That's exactly. And the stakes here. Vice Mayor Miller? Yes. Um, I have some comments, but uh, if Dodie was going to make a presentation, could I, we let her make a presentation and then I make my comments? Yeah, that would be fine if this would be. I would like to sure. hear from her. Yeah. And then after that, I'm going to open it up to the public. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Dodie Keith, President and Owner of Keith and Associates, 301 um, East Pompano Beach Boulevard. Um, First, I want to apologize that I'm even having to have you have this conversation with us. You are a dear client to us. I have with me my Vice President of Engineering, known to you, Steve Williams, who's also been the client manager for you because you're such an important client for us for many years, and Lee Saraceno, who's our government liaison representative, is here with me as well. Um, there was a misunderstanding by my marketing folks on the submittal and some wording in there. This is not a construction bid where the documents submitted ends the conversation on how one is selected. It is an engineering uh, referenda, uh, RFP, which is selected by a process where your staff reviews all those documents. I want to be very careful that I don't create an unfair advantage because that would be one of those reasons. So I want to be careful to say to you, um, our financials are available. They, ha they are absolutely available and were delivered to your purchasing department. We feel very strongly that we are one of the strongest financial firms that are in all of the state of Florida, be it national, international, or local firms. So it is not an issue. It's an issue, it is a matter we are proud of. It is not a matter that we ever choose to hide or not disclose. So I'm very embarrassed that that's an item. We also look at it as not a substantial, when the process allows it to go through, we requested that we could cure that by simply providing the financials, which allows the process to continue, your staff to review all those documents, and the selection committee to move forward and decide on that selection, which would eventually come to you for ratification. So there's a long process. There's a lot of great firms. I would not recommend your number three of throwing it out and starting over because I think that would hurt you as a city. Um, although it would, would um, I really hope that you choose to allow us to cure and provide that and use the information we've provided to review us and and we'll follow that selection process um you know our, our i could go in i don't want to go into detail on that because it might you know there is a cone of silence and i don't want to talk about the details of the rfp so in that regard i stand before you as a consultant who's worked for you for a long long time and i'm embarrassed and i apologize that our submission was considered incomplete there was just some language in there that said or when available, which my marketing folks turn, turn, uh, deemed to, to believe that it wasn't necessary at the time of submission, it was just or, or when available. So that word or in the RFP language created um, some confusion on our end. And um, I would respectfully ask that um, you allow me to cure and you allow staff to continue their process, which um, goes through a long selection and a review and at some point um, I will respect their decision. Anyone from the public care to comment? I'd like to make my comment. I'll, let public. I'll do public. Anyone from the public care to be heard? 
I'm not seeing anyone close the public portion to be heard. Vice Mayor Miller. I, um, I tend to agree with my uh, fellow commissioner next to me. Uh, I never heard of the process called the curing process, but um, the eight and a half years or so I've served on this commission, um, Keith and Associates has been a, a, you know, a vendor of ours that has done a good job for us. I think we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot if we didn't uh, forgive them this mistake or their misinterpretation of the RFQ and, and give them consideration in the bid. I, I, to go through the whole process again, I think option three would cost us time and money. Uh, option two, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say within two weeks, and I believe they could probably produce it in two days, but give them two weeks to produce their fi financials, uh, I think it would be the best for our city. Each time you got to consider, actually, what is best for our city? This is a vendor that has a proven track record. This is a vendor that has a representative at every single commission meeting for over eight years that I've been in sitting here. This is a, a, a company that sends a representative to every single one of our commission meetings. And uh, if they made a mistake, I think we should forgive them and give them a chance to produce the financials so they could be in the running for this bid. Commissioner Drosky. I'm going to respectfully disagree with my colleague, Mr. Mr. Miller. I, I think every RFQ needs to stand on its on its own and whether someone's been doing business with us for 10 years or one year or one day each each situation needs to be evaluated separately unto its own its own merits and I read through all of the materials and I did not speak to the protester I guess would be in this particular scenario before um, the, the meeting tonight so I, I had no indication but I when I read the backup materials I had a problem with the city's wording uh, myself because the condition that we put out there that we advertise was number three your financial plan capital and capabilities read and I'm going to read it verbatim submit financial audits and statements performed internally or when available by an external auditor or accountant for the past two reporting years and that's how Keith and Associates responded they said when it was available and I think this was poorly written on the city's behalf instead of the word when and I know this is wordsmithing it really should have said if if it's available provide your auditors uh, otherwise provide your internal so I think the city goofed when we when we did this we could have made the wording a little bit better and to give um, the protester in this particular op an opportunity to provide those financials I would not go for a two-week period I think this is something that they either have or they don't have and can be provided you know in a matter of days um, because the standard is, did this omission undermine the necessary common standards of competition? And I'm going to say no if we give them the ability to do so. And I don't remember who pointed out already, this isn't going to award them the bid necessarily. This just puts them on the level playing field with everyone else. And then staff will evaluate and they'll either, be, you know, they'll either come before us later or they won't. We, don't, we won't know that until much, until much later. <clears throat> but the way that I read... Um, what we published out there, I think it deserves the opportunity because I don't think that it, we lived up to that particular standard in this case. I have a question for staff. Did the applicants have the ability to question or ask for clarification on any of the rules that were in the um, proposals? Yeah. Or uh, the we generally, and David shaking his head, yes. That are generally provided. Okay, so they have the ability to ask for clarification. Um, and if the lang and I agree that looking at it, that the language certainly needs to be stronger or, or more clear. Um, there were 26 applicants, is that correct? Yes. Through the, who yes. shouted that? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry, you might want to state your name for the record, please. Melissa Guzman, purchasing manager for the city of Delphi Beach. Thank you so much for that. Just so you didn't think it was the voice of God coming down. <laughs> um, the, uh, so with 26 applicants, only one made this error. So how big was the language? If only one person, one, one group made the error. Um, that's what I'm a little bit stuck with. And, and I, I, I don't like technicalities any more than anybody else does. I mean, th th like you said, this is not awarding them the contract. This just allows them to participate in the process, but the rules are the rules, and, and I am, I'm stuck with that because if the language was so vague, we would have had others come forward. 
and and everyone else seemed to be able to play within those rules. So I, I am I am torn because I think in a sense of fairness, uh, you know, while it was an error, it could potentially be a costly error. I'd like to make a motion to approve number two option, the uh, bid protest with the, uh, have the ability to comply within uh, three days, the rest of this week. So it will be a motion uh, upholding the bid protest by finding the uh, irregularity to be non-material and uh, subject to them providing uh, uh, the, the omitted finances within three days from or well, to the end of this week, if that's Friday, three days. Friday, Friday, Friday. Friday. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion before we call the vote? Call the vote. Roll call, please. Commissioner Battle? Yes. Commissioner Drosky? Yes. Commissioner Parnez? No. Vice Mayor Miller? Yes. Mayor Gantz? No. Hmm. So it's approved? Yes. Okay. And I apologize. I apologize uh, for disappointing you. Comments by the city manager? Yes, just quickly, I do want to uh, again commend our uh, city workforce. And uh, they've been out there constantly picking up debris. And as you know, last week, unfortunately, because of the issues with being able to get subcontractors, uh, Ashford now has been on the road and they've been doing very well. Uh, we are at 90% uh, for the first pass. We'll be at nearly 100% by Thursday and starting next week we will go through and start picking up the piles that have mixed uh, trash in with the vegetation, continue picking up any other vegetation that may have been pushed out after we went through the neighborhood and we're hoping by Monday, October 16th that we will resume normal bulk operations which is not this upcoming Monday but the following Monday and in the meantime, uh, solid waste is going to put a temporary <coughs> roll off at the Central City campus uh, where residents can bring their normal bulk there and we will dispose of it from there, but we cannot take the trucks off the second push yet um, for another week or so. And again, uh, we will be sending that information out through press releases, social media, things of that nature. And so I do appreciate the public's uh, patience with this. It's been a little bit of a uh, work in progress because of the issues from Hurricane Harvey and then with the widespread uh, destructive force of Irma and then with a follow-up by uh, Maria and uh, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, the U.S. Virgin Islands actually. Uh, so a lot of the contractors are planning to go there. Second thing is, uh, on tonight's agenda, there's one meeting in October, a regular city commission meeting. However, the October 17th regular commission meeting will actually be a commission workshop on coastal and beach management issues. That will be facilitated by sustainable management and then hopefully the chairwoman of the Marine Advisory Board, Katie Hendrickson, she'll also be there to provide information from the board's perspective to this uh, commission. But the important thing that we'll be discussing that night, which we said we would come back in the fall, is dealing with do you want a wall on the beach, do you want vegetation, dune plantings on the beach, how do you want to deal with westward movement of sand, and they'll also talk about some beach erosion issues, future regulations, things of that nature. So it'll be more of an informative workshop with no decision having to be made that evening. And then lastly, on November 4th, the city will be hosting the Owens, Ryan Owens Memorial Run, which is the former Navy SEAL who uh, 
tragically lost his life uh, a year or so ago. And um, I do want to let the public know that security on the beach, probably starting sometime Friday evening, and we won't get into what that will be, will be heightened. Not because of what happened in Las Vegas, but because of who will be there. Because, and I can't discuss that either, so I apologize. <laughs> but I do want the public and the media to know that there will be increased security. Um, that workshop, will that be 7 p.m.? 7 p.m., yes. Yeah. Yes, and we will uh, put that out in, again through press releases, social media, and, and it will be here, okay. yes, unless the city commission would like it somewhere else. But here would work the best because of the TVs. Yeah. Thank you. Andy, do you have anything? Okay. Vice Mayor Miller. I just want to congratulate the city workers and the management team for uh, the cleanup. I've gotten certain calls from people kind of anxious that they're, they're hadn't been done yet, but all of a sudden those are gone, the ones that were calling already. And um, thank you for the, uh, the effort. And I thank all the employees for the effort they made to clean up this uh, tree debris and such. That's all. Thank you. Commissioner Bell. Uh, Mr. City Manager, I wasn't so lucky today. Uh, the first pass came around and don't ask me why I was out on the street, but I got reamed. Oh. Uh, remember that the foliage has been there now for, for, for weeks. And when they picked it up, all the leaves were left there. And so there were neighbors out there that just reamed me out because they had to uh, rake those leaves up okay. and get them into the garbage can one way or the other. Uh, I do want to uh, thank all of my colleagues this evening for uh, designating uh, uh, Mr. Howell as our jazz ambassador. And um, I look forward to uh, him coming back uh, and, and interfacing with our students like he uh, normally does one way or the other. Uh, we're going to be moving forward. I had a very good meeting on yesterday with uh, the folk from the uh, Dang group. And we're going to be moving forward. Eric, we're ready to go, uh, Mr. City Manager, with some things for D.C. Highway. And hopefully once we get this first project uh, up and running, everybody will see and know that they need to come to invest in helping us get uh, D.C. Highway up and running again. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Battle. Commissioner Parnas? I think by now people know in my district that I vote with my district and my constituents. I represent you, District 3. Crystal Lake is in District 3. Your concerns are mine, and I will always be there for you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Drosky. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to be a little more wordy. Um, I want to thank all of the city staff that was at the Duns Run on Sunday. There was probably 90 individuals that were that were there and you know it was an early morning and this is amongst you know all of the hurricane debris removal and all the other operations that are ongoing in the city to get it back to as normal as possible it's a it's a herculean effort uh with this hurricane debris removal it really is and to see that many city staff there uh was absolutely fantastic there was a little bit of rain but it didn't dampen any of the spirits my wife and i did the the three mile uh, run and I set a personal best of 21 minutes. That's per mile, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank, I want to thank the staff for being there. Um, secondly, uh, on October 7th, this Saturday is my next Saturday office hours. I think there's one or two slots left. If you have anything that you need to see me about, please call the city manager's office uh, and I'd be happy to see you on Saturday if your normal schedule doesn't work out. And I, I do want to join on the bandwagon. Um, I, again, I, I lauded the city manager again and I can't do it enough with the with what he's been doing in the post hurricane uh, because most of us are back to our, well not me and the, my colleagues, but most of you are probably back to your normal lives. But the, the city still is, this is an ongoing everyday operation and the men and women, and it's not just those who drive the trucks. Yes, those are the ones that we see, but it's the people who's maintaining the trucks and putting gas in the trucks and who's sitting in the offices, you know, maintaining, you know, where the trucks go. Um, and, and just back basically to the normal schedules. It's, it's really a citywide effort and I want to applaud everyone 
uh, from the city. You know, Burgess is the face of that, and, and rightfully so. He's the city manager, but it goes all the way down the chain. Uh, and it's a true tribe effort here in the city of Deerfield Beach. And I want to, you know, just thank everyone uh, again from the bottom of my heart. I'm getting, you know, probably multiple, multiple calls like all of my colleagues. And everyone wants to know, you know, when is my going to debris, debris be picked up yesterday? Uh, and, you know, we have running water and we have power. And I'm telling everyone, you know, please be patient. And as the city manager indicated, the first pass is nearly completed. So, again, thank you for your, you know, patience from and understanding. I think once you put the true numbers that are out there that we're collecting, you know, over a year and a half's worth of bulk pickup uh, from this storm in a couple week period, uh, that the tonnage is, is basically it's 50 million pounds, 150,000 cubic yards of debris that's being picked up. When you explain it in those uh, real terms, I think people understand it. Uh, and it makes more sense. October 26th is the Halloween hoedown in my district in the villages of Hillsborough Park that evening. Uh, it's a great evening, uh, especially for children. If you can come out, uh, that would be fantastic. To the press that's here tonight, uh, the coat committee is being recalled uh, next Wednesday, October 11 at 6 o'clock p.m. at the MPO office. That is because the, the middle piece of Southwest 10th Street um, the kickoff meeting is tentatively scheduled. My understanding is for November 1st. Uh, so 10th Street will be heating up again. It's a project we have to keep our eye on the ball. My understanding, uh, and I have not you know, met with uh, FDOT yet, I'm trying to in advance, is that the purpose of next Wednesday's meeting is to give a preview of what the first presentation will look like. I assume because it's at the MPO that it will be open to the public. I encourage all of you who are interested to please attend and see what we are up against uh, here in the city of Deerfield Beach. And Mr. City Manager, last comment tonight. Um, October 17th, while we have the city workshop here, the FDOT is having their kickoff meeting for the Turnpike expansion from Atlantic to Wiles. And while that doesn't directly touch the city of Deerfield Beach's borders, I think it would be behoove us to at least listen in and to hear what information is being disseminated since We'll be here. Would you be able to send somebody from staff if that you deem it appropriate to get the information and report back to us? Yes, we, we send staff to those meetings regardless, even if there's a regular commission meeting, either Mr. Good or uh, someone from Eric Powers' department would be in attendance. Okay. Um, and that's all I have for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, again, and just to keep heaping the praise city staff has done a phenomenal job with the leadership of the city manager um, really an outstanding job we truly appreciate everything you're doing and no people don't realize it seems like everything is back to normal and, and just the piles are the problem but it's not the case and if you look at the situation you know some of the things that are stopping us from picking up some of these piles besides the mixed debris if you placed your pile underneath a tree when you've got these large grapplers that have to go underneath it and you've chosen or you're some unfortunately some people are forced to put their debris underneath an existing tree simply we can't gather that with it with the um, devices that we have so something's going to have to be worked out there and then i have some poor people that have um you know i think our neighborhood was picked up maybe a week ago um, for the first time and we had people that diligently bagged all of their debris in plastic bags and set it out beautifully and those poor people still have it in their front yards because that can't be handled that way because of FEMA's wonderful rules. So, um, you know, it's a lot to understand, and I, understand, I do understand the frustration. And uh, despite what some people like to think, it's not like ours were first on the list to be picked up. So um, there's that. Uh, I do. Th this is a long overdue praise, and I don't have exact information but there there is a uh there was an employee by the name of chuck who does the inspections for our uh, our building department and they did a air conditioning inspection at the hillsborough cove waterfront condominiums i received a very nice letter from a gentleman mr charles laser who wanted to praise chuck for doing an outstanding job um it's rare that we get letters like this sent to us not because people aren't doing a good job but it takes a lot of work and a lot of time You'll get these usually when people want to complain. Uh, you don't get a lot of these when people just want to say thank you very much. But this is a very nice letter. And Chuck and our, please make sure that uh, we congratulate and thank them for everything that they did with that. 
Also, this Friday we have in the villages of Hillsborough Park, we have our uh, Movies in the Park. That is at 7 p.m. to 9.30, and it's a wonderful Halloween-themed movie of Hotel Transylvania 2. So you can bring the kids out there, and hopefully I believe that park has been picked up of debris so they're not sitting in piles um, out there. Uh, one last thing, and, and I, look, as an elected official, you get criticism, people come at you from all angles, and, and that's the right, and I understand that. And most of the stuff you, you let roll off your back and no matter how disgusting it is and how many lies it might be out there, at some point uh, lines get crossed. And, and I think it's, it's right for us to stand up and point that out. Um, especially when they start to bring in and speculate and quite frankly just flat out lie about individuals that are in the community that aren't elected officials. Um, so Mr. Power, I sent you a picture. I'm gonna bring up, I'm gonna ask him to bring up this picture. So this was brought to my attention as something that's on social media, and I'm going to call him out by name. This is John Grassi. Mr. Grassi decided to post this picture. It says, we thank all the volunteers after Hurricane Irma that helped our community, including Mayor Gans. Our only question is, would Mayor Gans have volunteered if there were no cameras? Mr. Grassi took it a step further, and I'm going to read this by saying, what is Bill Gans doing with Eddie Sarazen? Something just is not right here but it surely looks like Eddie from the back in blue. We clearly need to investigate more about what Eddie is doing and what is going on in his business operation and how he may possibly influencing the voting during the election process. Very interesting because you can see the date September 14th. I have no idea what election he's talking about. He further compounds it with look who else is with Mayor Bill Gans through those back is to us. I'm sure it is Eddie Sarazen. Further, it's at a house where Eddie goes to to have all those living in the home fill out a mail-in ballot. We need to know more about his relationship with Bill Gans as well as the business he is running. Eddie, in my opinion, brokers votes in some fashion. Do not know a whole lot about it, though it certainly would seem by his comments he does. But I think it would be interesting for the state to step in and understand more about what he's doing at his business. I'd like to understand it more as well. Mr. Grassi, you're a fool, and I'll tell you why. The individual you're talking about there in the middle is our state representative, Patricia Williams. Yes, it is. <laughs> I am very sorry because some people's minds, well, I guess they suppose when they see people of color, they assume they all look alike. <laughs> so my apologies to uh, Mr. Sarazen for having his name slandered and drugged through the mud just because Mr. Grassi doesn't like me. I also apologize to Patricia Williams and these poor people whose house that is. Yes, that is a cameraman. That is one of our city employees who works in our public information office. What we were doing there on September 14th, that was the day we're when the, excuse me, I'll, let, I'll finish it, thank you. <laughs> that is when the Broward County opened up a pod at Quiet Waters Park to have water and ice distributed there at that park. I was there when it first opened, before it opened actually. There was no crews, there was no cameras, but there was State Representative Williams, there was Senator Gary Farmer, and there was Commissioner Mark Bogan from the county there, as well as other volunteers, including Ms. Freitag, as well as others who I called and said, come on out, we could use some help in distributing this food. This is on a Thursday. Rather than go to work that morning, I came in to work that location. While we were working that location, our public information office department showed up with cameras because they knew it was in the, located in the city of Deerfield Beach, given out to Deerfield Beach residents that were going to film it whether I was there or not. What Patricia Williams and I did is exactly what we did back on July 15th at a food giveaway that we had at Oviedo McKeithen Park. When that food giveaway that was sponsored by state representative was being held, we I, I said to her, you know, we're not really getting, the people aren't able to come to us, we need to go to them. We knew that the Palms, located in Deerfield Beach in District 2, were primarily elderly and disabled people that didn't have the means or the ability to get transportation to come to the food giveaway that was on July 15th. So Patricia Williams, myself, and really the entire crew, including BSO, Sheriff Scott Israel, loaded up my pickup truck with the remaining food from the food giveaway, and we drove over to the Palms. To my knowledge, I don't recall any cameras, I don't recall any media, we just did it, and that's what we did. And on September 14th, when we were doing the water and ice giveaway, when I was calling volunteers, 
and I'll give them praise. Tyrone Philpark showed up and filled up his truck and took it to the people that needed it most who didn't have the ability to drive over to the giveaway. We also had people like our former um, city employee, uh, Linda Hunter, showed up as well. And we loaded up her van to take it to people that needed it most. Patricia Williams and I knew that this was something that needed to be done. We got a caravan of BSO and we were piggybacked by the public information officers to film it because they were going over to film uh, what was being done with a food giveaway by Oceans 234 at being done at Praxis, which is an, an over 55 community for people, disadvantaged people over there. So they piggyback on, on us. On our way to several of the areas uh, of the over 55 um, homes, such as run by the Deerfield Beach Housing Authority, we went to Benai Brith, we went to several others to distribute food and water, or excuse me, water and ice there. I, got a, I was contacted by a elementary school teacher over at Deerfield Beach Elementary who teaches the autistic children at Deerfield Beach Elementary School. She said, I have a student whose grandmother is home. They have no ice. They have, they have very little water left. And she cannot leave because she needs to stay with him. And, and they are stuck without electricity. I give the address to BSO. We all caravaned over there and dropped that off. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a little blue cooler. When we got there, they had less than a gallon of milk, uh, less than a half gallon of milk left floating in, in what used to be ice water, sitting there with some packages of cheese and whatever else little food they had in that cooler, and that's all they had. We delivered ice and water to them. And then we went door to door, and we knocked on doors and found people that didn't have electricity didn't have the means to get out and we delivered food and water and we did that. I can tell you on the Tuesday night after the hurricane, there wasn't any media when I was over at the Palms buying food myself for the residents that were over there. When I was there in the dark with them putting in lights that I took from my own home to power the lights in their emergency, in their elevators, because excuse me, their stairwells, because their elevators weren't working. There was no media there then. And when I sat there and waited for the fire department to show up to provide diesel fuel for their generator, and to provide ice and water for them, there was no media there for that also. When we went to Friday night at Praxis, where Commissioner Battle was already there, when we showed up there and realized the conditions were poor, and I got on the phone and sat there in the dark with those people, working out with the ownership to provide lighting and to secure their pool and do some of the things they needed to do for those residents, there was no media there. When I left to 7-Eleven to go pick up ice for the people there that needed ice, because they had insulin that needed to be refrigerated, there was no media there. So Mr. Grassi, if you're gonna lie while you're sitting on your ass at your home behind your computer, I suggest you get your facts straight before you start slandering people's names. Mr. Sarazen was your friend. He simply didn't support your candidate in this election. So you choose to slander him and go after him. I think it's disgusting what you've done. If you don't believe me what you've done, Here's an email between you and Gene Robb talking about inviting Mr. Mr. Sarazen to all of your meetings for the Haitian community churches and you begging Gene Robb to show up because they hadn't seen her since the election. So that's what you wanted them to do. I'm sorry that you had a falling out with him, but to slander the man is completely wrong. You want to take a shot at me, get your facts straight. I am tired of people trying to ruin other people simply because they disagree with decisions we sit up here and make. I will also add this. This is the same John Grassi who supported a candidate in the election who, when questioned by the state attorney's office under oath with his attorney present, admitted that the entire reason that he ran for office was to supplement his income. Tell me why in September 2016 they make the decision to enter the race for mayor because I knew that Mayor Rob was not running anymore and that it was a small town part-time mayor and it would pay like 30 some thousand dollars a year which would supplement my income. So I felt that I had a chance of running against somebody else because it was an open race. When asked by the state attorney, so one of the primary reasons you decided to run was for income purposes? Yes. This is Mr. Ken Mr. Uh, Grassi's candidate of choice, Mr. Ken Wayne. You know what, Mr. Grassi? You got your facts straight, you didn't win the election, but for you to slander people like you're doing, um, it's completely wrong and it needs to stop. Thank you. Yeah. A motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Good. Meeting adjourned. Yeah. Thank you all again. Thank you. Um, like Lawrence? Yeah.